from an energy behind that? Well, that's all very encouraging. And, and you know, I don't, I really hate to be negative and cynical, but we've all dealt with hundreds, if not thousands, of cases over many years, which largely comprise of <coughs> waste fathers living lives beyond their declared income and paying not a penny. So what is going to change with those? I think you know, haven't they got a get out of jail card now, free now with, with the voluntary arrangements? They it's, haven't. It's not an equal partnership, is it? It's, uh, well, the thing that, of course, is there as well is that if the, if the voluntary arrangement doesn't work, then either the parent with care or the non-resident parent can come straight back to us and actually um, sign back in to what will be, we hope, in the future, our new and much more efficient, streamlined uh, system of, uh, of statutory maintenance. And then all of the full powers of our en enforcement uh, actions can be brought into play. So the real, it, is not, it is more than just a safety net. Um, we will be actively promoting the fact that if your private arrangement doesn't work, uh, then you can come straight back to us and immediately we will put you back onto our systems and you will be part of the, the statutory system. Can I just add something to that if I could? So the, the people who were forced um, by the law to come to us, the benefit claimants in the past, not that many of them actually ended up with a uh, satisfactory arrangement because a lot of them, as soon as they were off benefit, left again. And quite often we were interrupting a private arrangement that they'd got and saying most of that money now comes to the state. So the, um, a lot of the, the, the um, people who were pulled in by Section 6 didn't end up with anything. And where there is a private arrangement, the research that we have is that people are more likely actually to pay them than they are to pay through a statutory scheme or a court order because clearly there's willingness on both sides to do it. So we provide the, the choices to people. We target those who would previously have had a Section 6 uh, compulsory claim, the, the benefit claimants, they all get a referral to options. Um, unless they actively say, I don't want to talk about it, they get outgoing calls from options, and the, option, the other child mentions option service, when I say option, sorry, then talks them through their choices, and roughly half of those who make an arrangement make it privately, and about half actually do come to the CSA. And if the private arrangement doesn't work, they always have the choice of coming to currently the CSA in the future. The future scheme is any time. So our overall objective, as Janet says, is to maximise the number of arrangements for, for the uh, separated families as a whole, not just the ones in the statutory scheme. And we've pulled together a sort of starting point, what we think exists now from existing research. And we'll be going out with a major research programme in the new year to, to a, a, a big, you know, multiple thousands of child benefit uh, recipients who are in separated families to establish exactly what the position is now and then repeating that each year so we can see the movement in the total number of arrangements in society for, for children whose parents live apart and also how it's moving and if we're being successful we'll see the overall arrangement going up we're neutral on whether, what the mixture between private and statutory arrangements is as long as the number overall goes up and it's working. So I think that's the, the reassurance. I hope it gives you some of the reassurance you're looking for. Where the, in the situation you described, then you'd expect people like that to come to the statutory service because the father can't be relied upon to come to a private arrangement. But that, that isn't everybody. Um, it's, in, it's about 47% are not paying, isn't it? Of what, sorry? Of people in the statutory scheme, currently about 27% don't pay in a quarter, about 20% don't pay in a year, and about 8% don't pay anything. But most of those are once they're in the statutory scheme, we do get money. And that's, that's within the period. You know, eventually, if people have got out assets or income, we do get it. Now, clearly, it would be much better if we got it when it was actually due. But you know, the people we're talking about, that gets very difficult. In the market as a whole, only about 47% of people are paying, but we're trying to increase the number of private arrangements too. Right. It, the 99 um, operational improvement plan, oh no, the 99 reform program cost round figures 500 million and frankly was a failure. What was learned from that in devising the operational improvement plan? And can we now call the that a success, the Operation Improvement Plan? I think so. The, the Operation Improvement Plan set out to do a number of things which it laid out, and, and the sort of strategic context for it 
was to, to improve the performance of the, uh, the current schemes while the government came up with a longer term strategy to replace them. And we said we'd get a certain amount of extra money for a certain amount of extra separated families within a certain budget and that we'd make improvements to the efficiency so we could uh, improve the IT system to an extent uh, so we could reduce the number of people working on it. And we did get more money than we said we would get over the period. We got benefit for more families than we said we would get. We improved the service, the telephony and throughput of applications to the extent, in fact, more than the extent we said, and we stuck within the budget. So the Operation Improvement Plan wasn't designed to get us to a perfect system. It was designed to give us a stable platform on which we could build the future long-term changes. If you remember, John Hutton and I came here and talked about a twin-track approach of doing that. So I think we can say that the, OIP, the Operation Improvement Plan, I'm sorry, delivered what it said it would within the budget it said. So I think against the backdrop of what had happened in the um, 99 reforms, we should view that as a success. Right. Well, running to 2014, um, we've got the new CMEG, and we've got the two old schemes. So you're running three separate schemes on three separate computer platforms. And I think if the resources are there for us to move forward at the rate that we hope to transition, and of course that, that clearly is going to be a question with the, with the difficult public expenditure uh, situation that we were... We well, my were question faced. was going to be, um, what is the implications for this for your administrative costs? We, uh, uh, the current plan that we have is that we can contain within about the same amount of money that we spent last year and are spending this year both the running of the current schemes because we are getting more efficient in the way we run those current schemes and you can see the reduction in, in headcount that we've had over the last year and the investment in the new. So there will be, be an increase sorry, in the years when we're actually moving the cases from the current two schemes to the future scheme. There will be a temporary uh, increase in cost, but in the years of preparation, and it'll, uh, it'll be about where it is now, and once we've got everybody in 2014, we envisage about a third reduction in the, in the running costs of the, of the scheme through a more efficient system and more automation and spending more time uh, on enforcement rather than on calculation because we'll be using data from elsewhere around government to do the calculations. But have you been given confirmation that those resources for that bulge will be available? No. And what happens if they're not forthcoming? Then we'll need to re look at the plan how we transition. I think so one of the things I want to say that the board is very keen um, um, to um, lobby very hard for the kind of resources that we put there. We've built in um, something like 70% efficiency savings over the next 10 years. And that, I think, uh, you know, is going to be a tall order uh, on, the, on the budget that we've already set. Now, to, to face... Uh, greater cuts than that, I think, um, could, could really put in jeopardy the rate at which we will be able to transition and the rate at which we will be able to move people from uh, the current uh, two schemes onto, onto the new system. But well, that, uh, and we think that that efficiency is something that we can bring about, as Stephen said, a third less, a third, an increase uh, by a third uh, in terms of our outcomes, but a decrease in the resource that we will need ultimately by a third. They're ambitious targets, but they're targets that uh, we believe that we can reach. But not, of course, if, uh, if there is a further hit to the, uh, to the baseline of our budget. Well, I'd have been disappointed if Yanna said something like that. But from March 2006 to March 2009, your staff numbers drop 17%, but your costs go up. That is partly because, of course, we're moving on to developing well, the new scheme. No, no, the, yeah, but you've got a 2,000 reduction in staff numbers, mm -hmm. but staff costs increase. Well, yeah, I'll take that. So if you look at the average number of people we employed over the years rather than the, the two points, because clearly you pay while you've got them, not you don't pay on an annual basis. And I think that the NAO report says an 8% reduction in, uh, yeah, in, in do you, people. You do agree uh, and can, that yeah. in March 2006 you had 11,034, and March 2009 you had 9,192. I do. And over that time, your staffing costs have increased. Yes, but the, the, my point is that we didn't employ that, those number of people throughout the full year. So we reduced the number of people gradually over the year. The average number that we had was an 8% difference. And there was an 8% increase in costs. So over those three years, we, we got a 16% um, yeah, movement there. So you've had an 8% 
you're admitting to an 8% reduction in average numbers of employees, but an 8% increase in staffing costs. I'm agreeing to it rather than admitting it. I mean, it's not something that I've yeah, an well. I'm agreeing that's what we did. And, and my point is that if the, the, the increases across the civil service, just the general annual increase, compounds to about 13% in that time, and the other 5% is due to a mix of resources that's changed. So one of the big criticisms of us, uh, and quite rightly, at the time of the 1999-2003 you know, reforms was we didn't have internal capability that could let us tell whether our, our contractors, our IT supplier and so on, was doing a good job for us. Uh, and we've put that right, we've got more skilled people. We've also have introduced a complex caseworker, more people in enforcement, which is a higher paid job than the, 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 what's called an administrative assistant, which we had about 1,000 in 2006, we're down to 400 now. So we've changed the mix of the people we employ to provide a better service, and we've got more expertise well, in Well, there were a large there. number of temporary appointments, weren't they? Do you what, sorry? There were a large number of temporary appointments in 2006-2007. Most yes. of them didn't work for a full year. So, you know, talking about the average employed over a year, you didn't have a full year's cost for all those people that you're employing. That's the point I'm making. It. And you, you, the, we've got the suggestion here of a third increase in outputs and a 70% reduction in costs, which sounds fantastic. All I'm saying is, over that three year period, you had a 70% sure. reduction in total numbers at year end. For an 8% increase in, in staff costs. But the, the year end is what drives the staff costs, though. The year, it, it's the, the, how many days of the year you employ them for that drives the staff costs, not the year end. Yeah, but so but even, it, it, even, on, even on that basis, there's been an 8% reduction in staffing numbers, but an 8% increase in yes, staffing yes, costs. Has, I think I've explained so, Which why. is not sort of, <laughs> don't bode well for a third increase in outputs and a 70% reduction okay. in costs. Okay, let me, let me address that in a slightly different way then. So in the period you're talking about, we were working with the, machine, the computer systems which we have. We have two computer systems, one of which didn't work very well at all at the beginning. is now better, but we have uh, 1,500 people or so working on clerical cases. That goes. The, the reason we need to move forward with the reforms to have a simpler uh, scheme and more efficient IT is to achieve the um, figures which Janet said, which were a 30% reduction in costs and a 30% in increase in outputs. 70% is a sort of netted off figure. When you put those two things together, we have efficiency. So that we, we're not saying that we've achieved efficiency in this period. We achieved a 42% increase in the number of children benefiting and the amount that we collected. But we know, although we're now reasonably effective, uh, with not an efficient operation because we have two computer systems, one of which still has uh, issues with running some of the cases. And the next move, why it's so important we do make the next move in the strategic reform program, is it is to get us out of that position to have a, a simpler scheme with less uh, recalculation in it, less collection of data from uh, individuals, and a, a computer system which increases productivity rather than gives us some of the problems the present ones have done. So you're actually comparing things which are really quite different, I think, Com coming out at them, the, the, uh, uh, the figures, as, as uh, Stephen has explained, are really the figures that, that, uh, that you're talking about in terms of the 8% uh, additional cost there have to do with the current situation. The efficiencies I was talking about are actually the efficiencies that we will build in when we have moved across to um, the new IT system, much more automated and uh, with web access, a lot of self-serve, um, and we will need, therefore, far fewer staff the system will be very much quicker to operate and we'll be operating on annual gross income rates and information that we get directly from HMRC rather than having to uh, track down I, the MRC. I hear what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. I hope that what you're saying turns out to be true. But this select committee and its predecessors has heard similar prognostications since 1993, most of which didn't turn out to be right. So you understand yeah. a slight bit of scepticism because what you're projecting is sort of 10 years from now <coughs> some of us might still be here, some of them might not. <laughs> but can I, can I just ask you a, 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 a question here? In the history from 1993 of, of, of the CSA, at what point did the amount of maintenance it collected exceed the cost of collecting that maintenance? I couldn't answer that. I don't, I, I don't think it's ever, since the first couple of years, been less than was collected. But I, honestly, I, I don't have the note stats for the first 10 years of those 12 years before I was involved in my mind, I'm sorry. Since I've been here, then the, the, it's always been more than, collected more 
um, than um, it, it, it spent, and that ratio has improved over the last few years. But if I can just, for a second, return to your other point, that we sat here, John Hunt and I sat here three years ago, and said we would achieve some things for a certain amount of money, and we did. We achieved everything we said we would do within the budget, we said. So while I agree that that's not an, you know, we haven't improved efficiency to the extent which we would like to, but we, we did get 42% more output for this increase in costs. We did deliver what we said we would in the period for the budget. So I hope that, again, would give, while I understand the scepticism on, on long, bitter experience, I hope that gives you some comfort that when we sit here today and say, and this is what we can now achieve over the next period within this budget, that, that you have some confidence that it may well be true. And I think I'd turn you to your first question to me as we came in. Um, one of the reasons that I, I did want to take over the chair of the board and establish a board that would um, be there both to support and challenge the executive was because actually we looked at what had actually been achieved by Stephen and his colleagues in the operational improvement <coughs> plan and could see that the possible, there was a possibility for the future that was a very positive one and that we wanted to be part of actually making that happen, challenging it so that we didn't slip backwards, um, but actually being part of, of a solution for the future uh, for child maintenance for children in this country. And I think you wouldn't have had the kind of people that we've managed to uh, attract to the board um, had they not had a healthy scepticism about the past, but actually um, a belief from the statistics that uh, Stephen and his colleagues had achieved uh, through the CSA and the, in the, through the Operational Improvement Plan, that we could actually take that uh, real shift into the future. After all, we had brought in Stephen and other members from the private sector who really knew and understood uh, about IT systems, rather than actually trying to rely on uh, people whose, whose business perhaps is policy development uh, to try and, uh, uh, and unusually uh, take a step change into a different career and uh, devise an IT system, which I think has been one of the problems that <coughs> we have had in, in government in, in more generally. Uh, I don't want to drag this out. I would, I would simply say, and it, it is to your credit, um, you were much wiser than your predecessors because you made damn sure before you put pen to paper, that you could actually do it, whereas some of your predecessors made rather outlandish claims about what would be achieved. So it, it was a positive comment, that. I <laughs> Thank you. Jenny Willett. Thank you. Um, I've got some questions about IT performance. I apologise for uh, my cold. Um, the IT history of uh, the CSA is not a, not a happy one. I'm sure we'd all agree on that. Um, in 2006, the NAO found that there were 500 problems with CS2, um, and even after the upgrades of the operational improvement plan, um, the number of problems had actually gone up to um, 1,000 problems with the system. And of these, um, I understand that 400 have no workaround. Um, how much more is needed to be able to fix those problems? Can I just um, try and establish some common language back on stone? So a problem and a defect aren't quite the same thing. So the, the position in 2000, if, if I can explain that. So if, if the light went out now, that would be a problem. The defect could be a bulb or a fuse or a switch. And if six light went, went out, that would be six problems, but it may be one fuse going. So what we had in 2006, and, and again, I would say the NAO didn't find it. It was, it was part of a commercial agreement between us and, uh, and EDS, was we had a list of 506 agreed defects, things that the system had, was supposed to do, and everybody agreed it was supposed to do, but it didn't do. And we'd done a commercial settlement with EDS, which said that they would give us 107 million of the 161 million development cost back, and they would fix those 506 faults at their own expense. So that was never designed to be an exhaustive list of problems with the system. It was, a, it was a list of agreed defects which they would fix, and they have fixed. So 350 of them were done through four small releases, and the other 150 were rolled into the big upgrade, we did, which we, we called PR1. We put a lot of different things together. What we have now is a 1,000 problems rather than defects. And, and a defect can cause multiple problems, and it can sometimes take multiple defects to cause a problem, which was illustrative. Uh, 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 there's then a further piece of language. If there's I a lot of problems. It is, uh, yeah. the, the number of times a problem occurs we call an incident. And we get about 3,000 incidents a week now. 
but 70% of them are caused by about 60 of the problems with a, a small number, again, of defects behind them. So we do plan to fix some of those, and we think that will take about another 1,500 or so, 1,000 to 1,500 incidents of the problem away. We'll do that in April. So when we first did PR1, which was the big upgrade, which allowed us to really see every case, whether it was stuck or not, before that we had this issue case disappeared into the system, then we were getting 7,000 incidents a, uh, a week. By fixing some of the problems and the defects behind them, we've got that down to three now, and we hope to get it down to under two in April, by which time we think we can probably live with that, because there are workarounds, many, many of, of, the other, of the other issues there. So the, the, I think that answers your question, it was that we will fix about another um, 30 or so of the defects, which will take out quite a few problems and around a third of the remaining actual incidents, which is where you see one of these problems affecting a customer. So you're going to have very few that are left with no workaround, basically? That, that's, that's right. There'll be some, and we will keep, and the, and the NAO quite rightly forecast, a continued increase in clerical cases for a couple of years. We will still see some cases going clerical, but the rate will slow down as we get to that, as we get through to that. But so some of these problems aren't defects. Some of them are things that we did, they weren't in the spec for the system. So I'm going to give you an example. The system was written so it could, own, it, it, it could uh, deal with up to 100 transactions on a case, 100 received receipts on a case, which was fine for the first couple of years, but once you've got up to you know, eight years or so of a case, then you're going to be full. So that, that's not a defect. It's how the system was designed. It's a real problem. Did nobody it's, think of that before? I couldn't come that. We fixed it now. That's one of the ones we fixed. But, but you know, that, that isn't a defect, it's, but it is a problem. So which, I'm trying to just bring out the point we can't equate the 506 to the 1,000, the different currencies, if you like. Okay. I'm sorry that was a very complicated answer. <laughs> but everything to do with the IT and the CSA is very complicated. <laughs> um, overall, um, the cost for the IT has been absolutely massive. Um, the NAO estimates that it's going to be, um, by the end of um, CSCS and CS2, it'll be, um, the total cost will be um, around a billion pounds. Um, how does that compare to what the original cost was expected to be? And because of the massive difference between that, how confident are you that the cost for the new CMEC IT system um, aren't going to escalate to the same extent? Okay. The billion pounds is, is the, the mm -hmm. NAO's uh, estimate. If that's what it costs us over 21 years to develop and run a production system for a couple of million cases with multiple payments in and out, that doesn't sound like an awful lot to me um, for, for those main systems. So you're talking about 40-something million a year for, for development and running and support and so on. So I, I think that's probably a reasonable figure uh, for the sort of system that we've got now. That's only part of our IT cost, <coughs> though. So we do also spend money on the, on the, you know, the desktop machines that people have and other systems that we have. So we're, we're about 100 million a year is our, our running cost. The, that was the first, first part of your question. The second question was how does it compare to what it was supposed to be? The cost of the system over, over 10 years, which was three years development and seven years running for CS2, was supposed to be 465. Uh, and I think it'll be something similar to that. So we got that 107 million credit. We also got three years free use of um, CSCS, the older system, as a part of that deal. But we have spent more money going back in. So I, I can't give you a precise answer because the way that we pay for the system has changed in 2005 in that the Department for Work and Pensions renegotiated all its individual contracts on different applications and broke it up into uh, application development being one invoice, but the use of all the mainframes together, the amount of usage being another one. So you can't actually relate very easily individual systems to the invoice, um, but, uh, but broadly about the same. And the third question you asked me was how much would it cost to run the future one. The, the, the putting in place cost, the development uh, cost, and the lifetime licenses for the future scheme, uh, we have at about £120 million is our current view, uh, and, but that only includes three years of running. So because we're using a different approach of taking packages and um, which, which run on, on smaller machines are more efficient to run and take much less uh, um, I think the word, I'm sorry, customization, much, more, much less specific development than we expect to have a much more efficient system in the future at uh, a much lower cost uh, and that's reflected in the sort of reduction in the overall running cost which Janet uh, outlined earlier on. And how confident are you that what's predicted is actually going to be the cost? 
I'm confident that provided we can fund the transition, we can get to a much lower cost. The, the, the difficult period for, for, for the government to, you know, that's in place at the time that it has to be made is do they want to fund this transition to get the caseload out of two existing not very efficient systems onto a third much more efficient one. Uh, but, but once we're there, I'm confident, and, and you know, the technology that we're using and the packages that we're using are widely. And we're using a banking package that the, the National Bank of China uses. You know, so that there are many, many users of these systems, very large systems, uh, and, and so the running costs for them are proven. Rather than writing a piece of code from scratch, which is what CS2 is, mm. with, with the incredible complexity in it, uh, and it wasn't designed particularly efficiently. For those of us that are not as a I, I, IT. Uh uh, literate as a student two years. I mean, we, we I think, would, would talk about the fact that we're not trying to ask civil servants to specify an IT system um, and then uh, incur huge costs with the kinds of customization that you then, uh, uh, and, and changes that you then have to bring because you haven't specified it uh, uh, correctly. We are buying off the shelf packages. We effectively are a bank. We take money in, we give money out. So, a banking system. We manage cases, so there's a case management system on the front of it. So actually, the costs are really in the, in the integration of those uh, and the relatively small amount of customization that will be needed for, for our people to actually uh, in interact with our customers. The, the actual development bit, what, what the TCS or our contractor are doing to the packages is about £10 million. Pounds. So a much smaller you know, creative effort, if you like, into building the system compared to £160 million in, in CS2. Okay. Um, the number of clerical cases, has, as you mentioned, has grown quite alarmingly, really, um, from 19,000 in March 2006 to 75,000 in September this year. Um, and it still appears to be rising, and you mentioned earlier that there's predicted to rise into the future. Um, what can be done to stop that increase? We won't stop that increase, I don't think. I think, you know, the... the um we can stop if, if we invested, you know, open-ended into solving all those thousand problems and their underlying defects and so on. Then you could stop the increase. We'd still have the number we've got, but we, we've explored all sorts of ways of, of getting cases back onto the system and decided it's too risky to try and do it. So, given that the system only has a limited life and we don't really want to keep investing in it, then we, we won't stop. We can slow the increase down by solving those problems. But again, I, you know, I think it, it was the right thing to do was to take those cases clerical. We're collecting about six and a half million pounds a month for the cases there. So, you know, if you, so that those people on those 70,000 cases are getting an average of a thousand pounds a case a year, which is pretty close to what people on the system get. It was the right thing for the clients. It is inefficient and it contributes to our increase in costs, which the chairman uh, pointed out earlier on, to the cost not falling as quickly as we'd have liked. But I think in terms, you know, given that, uh, sorry, if, if we work on the assumption we are going to be able to move all the cases to the future system, uh, then the first ones we'll do will be the clericals. So when we launch the future scheme in 2011, the first bit of the caseload we, we move will be the clerical ones. Uh, and then that, so that's how we see ourselves getting out of that particular problem. But I think it's also quite interesting to realise that actually um, finding these stuck cases was because of the, the latest upgrade to the IT, the one that was called PR1, actually enabled us to see where all of these cases were stuck. Um, before we could see them, they were still stuck, but we didn't know where they were and therefore couldn't respond and deal with customers uh, efficiently because, and, until they wrote to us. So in, in a sense, what we did was to unearth a problem that we'd inherited and therefore, and then institute a way of actually trying to, to bring a solution uh, which, uh, which has got to be in the client's interest, even though it is uh, uh, cumbersome, if you like, and, and expensive. But it was actually a positive uh, move uh, that, uh, to expose where these cases had been stuck and then to try and do something about them for people and at least get the money moving um, in, a, in a clerical fashion. Um, you, you've <coughs> both talked about sort of the, the additional cost of dealing with the clerical cases because I'm that's three times as much to deal with a clerical case than one on the system. Um, and uh, I'm sure, as well, not just in terms of the cost, I mean, from all of our own experience as constituency MPs, um, it's much, much harder to deal with, to help someone who's got a clerical case. You know, not only by nature is the case probably more likely to be complicated, but trying to get hold of the right person or somebody who's got any idea what's going on within this, the CMEC is an absolute nightmare. Um, so, um, given that I know that you said that you're going to start transferring cases over in 2011 when you get the new system, but um, my understanding is that unless the parents involved opt for private arrangements, they won't actually be put onto the system um, 
until 2014. They're going to still, a lot of them will still be administered clerically until 2014. No, that's not quite right. The, the, um, I think uh, reading the, the annual memorandum, I can see why you would think that's the phrase they use, but the whole transition process is planned to finish in 2014. So, so how many would you expect still to be dealt with clerically by 2014, in 2014? No. I think that the resource is there, and I can't, I can't stress that enough, because one of the things that we have to look at um, is if, as, as I say, there, there, we are expected to bring in greater efficiencies than we've all, already bring, brought in, the, one of the only ways of doing that will be to slow everything down, and that actually makes it more expensive for government, not less, but it just pushes the cost away. So the, the rate of transition and the, the ambition to actually have everybody onto the new scheme, no clerical cases, no old schemes by 2014, is absolutely dependent so on the resource that we, that we have mapped when out. When would you expect most of the clerical cases to be on the system, then? Uh, subject to the caveats which Janet added, by yeah. the end of 2012. By the end of 2012, OK. Because because they're the most expensive, we'd move them first, and the 2014 is when we'd say we'd finish moving the cases off the current systems that are working onto the future system. Right, but the, the, the ones that would be moved towards the end are more likely to be the ones that are already on the yes. current system. That yeah, wouldn't so be the, 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 the most recent cases, so we, the, the intention is we do the clericals and then we work from the back. The older the case is, the sooner we move it. So if, if you've just been set up six months before we launch the future scheme, we won't be saying to you, you know, we're moving you now, you'll be the last to move. And presumably that's going to be very, ca very carefully monitored so that those people who've had cases that have been mucked around for years yes. uh, won't end up with more problems because they're now being moved <coughs> the system. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and um, the final question is about the lessons that have been learned from the previous... Um, significant IT problems. Um, how confident are you that um, TCS does actually have the experience to be able to deal with um, such a high profile package? I mean, I know you said that they deal with banking, yes. but what experience do they have of dealing with this sort of area, and how they, confident are you that it's not going to get screwed up again? Um, sorry, that's not part of no, no, it's, it's, Sorry, I, I understand the question. <laughs> if I want to repeat the actual words. The, um, so t TCS haven't done a major public sector uh, program in the UK before, which of course has an element of, of risk for us, but it has a much bigger one for them, and this is an absolute flagship um, contract for them. And, and they're very big in financial services in the UK, uh, they're very big in a number of other uh, industries, but they haven't really broken into government, so to them it's a big thing. The packages that we're using are ones in which they have lots of experience. So this bank's product, which is the, the banking package that they own, and, and the Bank of, of China, as I said, and then major banks in India and the Middle East and Australia also use it. They have lots of experience of it. And the uh, case management package we use, which is a very common one called Siebel, um, they also have huge amounts of experience in. So I have no doubt at all about their technical expertise. Uh, and their ability to do things in these packages. To help with the understanding the environment and the customer process and customer flows and so on, we've got some support from a, a uh, from Deloitte, you look at the third Deloitte uh, consultancy, who are helping us with the um, specification, working from our design of the customer process into a spec for the contractors to use, which again is something which they have some experience of. So we, we think there is, you know, it's because it's a new um, uh, sector for TCS to work in, we work wouldn't normally have had a client side support like that. But because we were building up the Commission's expertise as, as we're doing this, and because it is new to TCS, we've got that additional support. The net of which says I, I am f very confident that we'll deliver a uh, system that we need to deliver on More time. More confident than your predecessors were about EDS? I, I couldn't honestly say because I, but, but no, I don't, sorry, I'm making. My predecessors, I don't think, at the time of the launch, were particularly confident. I think people knew there were problems, but because it had been delayed for a while, there was pressure to put it live, and it's my understanding. Uh, and the selection of the PFI vehicle, which I think everybody thinks now was a mistake, uh, was done outside of, of my predecessors, shall we say. It was, it was a broader government policy to use PFI. So I, I don't know what their degree of confidence was at the very beginning. I know what they say it was at the time I took over from them, and, and I'm much, much more confident than they say they were with hindsight <coughs> after things had gone wrong. Thank you. Okay. I recognise that there's been a big reduction, both in in terms of the improved process times. I'm not quite sure of why in that it could be one of two things. It could, uh, these are real improvements as a result of the operational improvement. 
or it could be that the number of new applications are coming down, so therefore you've got more time to, to process them, process them properly. Do you have a feel for where the balance lies between those extremes? I do. We, we said we'd get it to 90,000 by the end of the operation improvement plan, fr from the 300,000 or so across the two schemes we had at the beginning. And we were down at something like 60,000, which is better than that, before the reduction in volumes took place. So the reduction in volumes is from the repeal of the Section 6, which made benefit applicants come in, which was in October of 2008, by which time we'd already overachieved the IP uh, programme. So I think it, it's a bit of both, as, as you say, but it's more the former. We, we certainly achieved that. <coughs> Excuse me. And we've reduced the number of people clearing applications proportionate to the intake. Uh, so there has been a big fall in the number of people in there. So it's, it's both, you were quite right. But you know, given where we got to before the fall in applications, again, I think I can claim that we had a genuine improvement in performance. So that um, improvement in process times has resulted in uh, changes in the, in the number of people allocated to tasks. Has it resulted in any other organisational no, we, we, um, we, we, we organised um, at the beginning of the operation improvement plan so we had people concentrating just on clearing applications. And I, I like to say clearing rather than processing because the process involves um, rather than just you know, doing something on a desk, you have to find the alleged father, game degree, is the father, find out his income and so on. So it's not a processing task, it's quite a, an interactive task. But, so we had people targeted focused just on that and split into dealing with the flow and attacking the backlog as well. So people weren't uh, you know, having to decide for themselves whether to deal with the one that Mrs. Smith just sent in or the oldest one, we organised into case lists and we got them to work on it. So we, but we've left that um, structure in place, although we've reduced the number of people in it in proportion to the, to the size of the workload. You met your target of um, processing more than 80% of the place within 12 weeks. I'm interested in the 12-week figure because um, originally there was a six-week figure uh, floating about market there, which has been just conveniently brushed out of uh, everything. Why was, there, what, was there a deliberate decision to, uh, to move it from six weeks to 12? Um, was that, uh, what was the reason for that? And is there a, going to be an attempt to cut it from 12 to a lower number? Um, it, it, good, good, yeah. The six weeks... Uh, uh, initially, um, I don't know if there's any real basis for, and we do we do about half in six weeks. So if, if you look at the the median rather than the mean clearance, the median is six weeks. So we've done 50 percent within six weeks. But if there's any problems at all with contact and trace or establishing paternity or if the non-resident parent doesn't come up with his income and we have to go on to his employer and if we can't find his employer or they won't cooperate, go on to the revenue, then you're never going to do those in six weeks. You know, you've got half a dozen interactions with, with members of the public or other institutions. So I think the six weeks was probably uh, was too ambitious and I thought 12 weeks was something we could realistically do. Uh, for 80% of cases. And we could set a target of you know, 55% in six weeks, something if we wanted to. But, but the, the, in order to give a, a realistic expectation to people making a claim of how long it would take, you really want it to be around the 80% experience rather than the 50% experience. Will there be improvements in future? In the future scheme where we intend to get the income from the revenue, not from the individual or his employer and third the revenue, then I think yes, that I think that six weeks for 75-80% then does become a realistic prospect, but we're still, I'd say, a couple of years away from doing that. But so will we see that six weeks becoming part of your formal target? Uh, we haven't actually, two years away from launch, discussed what the formal targets be, but I think they'll take a steer from the committee and, and it probably will. I think it's realistic once we're getting the income straight from the revenue. I think the board will certainly want to look at some pretty challenging targets, but they will also need to be realistic. As sure. Stephen said, you need to have it for something that you can hit for the majority of people. What you don't, the last thing you want to do is to build up people's expectations and then not deliver against them, I think. And the, one of the big and significant issues is actually, as Stephen has said, getting, getting the uh, information from the revenue and not having to chase uh, NR, NRPs who, a small number of whom, go to extraordinary lengths to, uh, to avoid being found. Can I come on to the question of accuracy um, and how you calculate the accuracy because you've changed the way you do that I think uh, at least twice over the past few years. Can, can you describe how you do sure. that and why you change? Well we have three measures of accuracy that we maintain the series for. One is the, if you like the official one, the one that's always been there which is to a penny 
Uh, and that was inherited from the fact that we were a social security offshoot and, and benefits are accurate to a penny because you're trying to be, be very careful with the amount of taxpayers' money you pay out. Uh, and to be honest, with the, the state that the CSA was in when we looked at these targets, people weren't interested particularly whether it was to a penny, it was they wanted some money flowing into be about right. So we then said, well, what's really important to people? And we came up with two others. One is the cash value measure, which is how close to what we should be paying are we paying. Uh, and we, we currently at about 90, or 96% on one, 98% on the other, so about 2% out on, on the old scheme, 4% out on the new scheme. And one that for individual customers, because that's an average, what we call the client measure, customer measure, which is it's to the nearest pound or 2%, whichever is bigger, which is a sort of tolerance which actually might matter to the client rather than the penny, which almost never does. So that's why we have the three. One, so we can show the series, and you can see whether our underlying performance is actually improving because it's to the penny and always has been. The one that we think is the most important to the client, which is to say how many of them are within what a you know, reasonable person would think was a fair tolerance. And the final one, you know, are there some big howlers that are putting the average way out, which is, which is the, the cash value accuracy. Accuracy is one which I, I wouldn't claim we've uh, achieved. It's, it's the one thing, in fact, I wouldn't claim we achieved what we set out to achieve in the operational improvement plan. Um, in, in the year before we launched it, it they were at 75 and 78 percent of the penny accuracy. We now were uh, at 84 and, and almost 90 for the, for the old scheme, but we wanted to get them both to 90. So we're still doing lots of things on accuracy. The, the problems we have are mainly around two areas. One is the effective date, and 45 percent of all the errors are in the effective date of changes. Uh, and actually, we're about to launch something to help people get it right. And, and it's 36 <coughs> different flow charts that apply in different circumstances because this, this is a hugely complex area. I've got them out baggy if anyone wants to look at them. 36 flow charts. And if you have a linked case, then when does it affect you know, the other people's as well? And the second one, which is 40% of the total um, of errors, is the income, the definition of income. Uh, and this is, um, again, may seem obvious. But there, there are some very complex rules about things like when tax credits are taken into account, because it depends which scheme it is, which part of the calculation within the scheme, who in the household receives them, exactly which tax credit it is, and we do make mistakes in them. So again, we're doing a, a, a spreadsheet um, guidance to, to help people with that. But the using the revenue um, data will take most of the income problems away. The effective date, we're trying to simplify the rules as we do regulations, so we can maybe only have 26 or 20 different uh, flow charts rather than 36. But accuracy is still a problem. But as I say, we're within about you know, 3 or 4 percent of where it should be, about the, the total assessments, uh, and making some progress, but we're not there. With that um, level of uh, complexity and looking at the future, are those measurements of accuracy ones that you will want to retain for the future, are they robust for the, for the future? And is there, is there a way in which you can boil this down to a much more much simpler headline rate of accuracy, is it, if, if you like, as a, a composite of those? There, there would be, and, and in fact we were working on that at some stage about a year ago, and I honestly can't remember what happened to the, um, to the work on it. We, we did try and do that, and then we, we, it hasn't made the top of the list. So yes, it's a sensible thing to do, and we probably should. On the um, looking at the accuracy figures, the old scheme cases, there seems to be they seem to be more <coughs> accurate than the new scheme. Does that relate to the, what you said earlier about the, um, the the dates, or is there another reason? For that? It's I think, and this is I couldn't actually improve this empirically, but I think it's the people working on the old scheme have been for a long time. And the cases are much more stable now. They're, they're all at least six years old. And you'll get a change in one aspect of the case, which you could do wrong or right. Whereas a lot of the new scheme cases are new cases coming in where it's possible to make an error in every one of the elements of the calculation. So I think it's a combination of the ex relative experience of the people, how long they've been doing it for, and the amount of, of elements of the case which are, involved, are new in the calculation. Uh, is, is what causes that. Because you, you know, if there were both new, if we were taking new business onto both and new people into both schemes, you'd expect it the other way around because the old scheme is more complex. But typically you're changing one of the factors in the calculation where more often it's a completely new case with the new scheme. So there's more and more opportunity to go wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hi, um, I have some questions on your case, case compliance. Um, in 2006, 
Um, you commit to increase your current scheme keys compliance to 80%. Um, you subsequently abandon that target, um, and the, the fact remains that you fail to meet it, and the current scheme case compliance um, stood at 68% in March 2009. So what went wrong? Well, I, I think that, again, it did, I can just discuss some of the words from it. We didn't abandon the target, we stopped using the measure, because it's not a helpful measure. So it's not that we thought we're no longer going to try and hit that, we said it's irrelevant, we'll never look at it again. And I'll, let me explain why. So the, the, what we set out to do with the OIP was get a certain amount of money to a certain number of children, and we did that. And the caseload didn't grow overall. So any measure that you're using which suggests we didn't hit what we set out to hit is clearly a bad measure. So that, that's, that's the principle. Why is it a bad measure? Because it, imagine you're running a business and some people pay cash when they get the goods others you have to send an invoice to and you forget to send some invoices. Case compliance only measures how many people on the invoices you sent out pay you. It doesn't measure the people you forgot to invoice and it doesn't measure the people who paid cash on the day. So you can think you're doing really well when you're not. So what case compliance doesn't have in is people who are maintenance direct, which is a good thing, saves the taxpayer money, it, it takes time out of the system and it doesn't measure people that we're not asking for the money. Okay, so where there's a calculation being done, but we're not asking them to pay. It only measures the ones we've asked to pay who do. So we said we're not going to measure on that because it drives people to the wrong behaviours. If you target a case worker on case compliance, all they have to do is stop asking for money from the non-compliant cases and they hit 100%, which is clearly a bad measure. It drives the wrong behaviours. The measure that we adopted instead was to say, let's look at where there's a calculation so the total number of goods in my analogy, and how many of those are paying. And that's what we call maintenance outcomes. So it's everybody who's got a positive calculation, whether we're remembering to ask them for the money or not. So it's a much, And we worked out the 69% target as being if we left the what's called assessed not charging, so the ones we're not asking for the money, and maintenance direct at the same level there were, what would case, and, and the, the case compliance went up to 80, what maintenance outcome would that be equivalent to? And the answer was 69, and we're currently at 73. So, which is why I, I know it sounds like I'm picking on the word, but we didn't abandon the target as unachievable. We said this is a bad target, it drives the wrong behaviour, it doesn't reflect the real performance of the business, so let's come up with one which does, and that's maintenance outcomes. It's every child who's supposed to be getting money, whether they do or not, it's a much better measure. But your maintenance outcomes still only, by your emission, has gone from 69% to 72%, it's still not very good. It's what, sir? It's, but your own admission, your, your new target, your maintenance outcome targets, you said 72%? No, the, the target was 69. We were right, at 60, uh, 69. Uh, it you, was uh, at your six, target was at 69, you're at 72. 73. 72. But, but the, the, the actual that's, was at 63. That doesn't sound very good to me. Right, well, sorry, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> See, it's, we started from 63 with a target to get to 69, uh -huh. and, you got to and we got to 73 at the moment. Now, because, and, and, and the important thing is, uh, has the number of children gone up? And the number of children has gone up from 560 to 800,000. You know, so that's what counts. The, the ratio is kind of interesting in managing it, but it's the number of children out of the case that they're getting money that really matters. Because uh, you, you, you another measure you use is the percentage of parents paying their maintenance in full. Now, it has increased since 2006, but it's from 46% to 53%. Um, but there's still 27% of non-resident parents are paying no meds maintenance. Now, again, that's down 10% from 37%. Yeah. So, in, in, in your measures, um, you know, is, is, that, is that good? Um, well, that, that, they're using the maintenance outcome measure, so that, that is the right measure to use. And, and that's, the 27 is the other side of the 73, which, you know, so obviously. Okay. The, the 53 is paying it within the quarter when it's due. It's not to say that's all who will we'll ever pay, because we, you know, we do chase arrears, we do collect arrears. Uh, that's pretty good by international standards. So the, the, the most recent Australian report that was published, their number's 50, sorry, 42%, 42.4, pay everything, but that's an annual, whereas our stats are quite so, so our, our annual would be lower than 53, but probably pretty close. To that. so that's pretty good. The Aussie, I, I think they're the, the best at this so far in the world, and I hope in our future scheme we'll catch them up. So I think that's pretty good. The 27 isn't particularly good, uh, and we need to do a lot more with that, but it is where we said we'd get to by now with the funding we've spent. And, and again, the future scheme, we hope to get that much further when we can be more efficient with how we use our time. But under the, the existing scheme, you, you know, you're dealing with everyone, in, in, including, as you said, because you may, may change the, 
the, the, the outcome those who are, are willing to pay. Under the, the new scheme, when you move to CMEC, um, you will only be dealing with the difficult ones. Would you expect those figures, therefore, to draw? Um, because you're not going to have the, the easy ones, the ones who have uh, come to private arrangements, the ones who are willing to pay in the first place oh, and have been sorry. quite happily paying. And I suspect those are the ones we never see as, as MPs as well. We, we think, because we'll be able to have, you know, we have new enforcement powers, we have a more efficient system, so we'll spend more of our time collecting and less calculating, we can improve on them still. I think you, you're right to make the point. The mix of the caseload might move, but most of the caseload had a choice of a private or coming to us now. So 60% of, of parents with care came to us um, without having been on benefit. Uh, they came to us because they, they wanted the CSA to be involved. So we, we envisage the caseload falling, but only by about 200,000. In the, um, in the future, uh, and we envisage the number that are paying going up. So 1.2 million to a million is what the business plan was based on. We're not planning to drive everybody into uh, the private uh, schemes if they feel they'd rather have the state involved. And clearly, relationships between separated parents aren't always conducive to them having a private arrangement. So I think you're right to say that you know any improvement in the future in the future needs to be seen in the context of a more difficult caseload. But I still think it's possible to make. There's uh, one group of people who MPs never meet. It's satisfied customers of the CSA <laughs> because there's a reason to come to, uh, uh, to meet it in the first place. And my impression is that most of my cases that come across my desk are parents with care with issues of arrears, uh, which they want to see addressed. My impression is also that the number coming to me with that situation uh, peaked a few years ago, has been falling for several years, but has gone up recently, as, as the general feeling I get. But particularly what concerns me amongst those people are the number who are coming to me with very large amounts of arrears, say over £25,000. Uh, is that a general trend, that, that the, light number of arre the, sorry, the size of arrears is getting bigger? And if so, why is there no alarm bell rings when arrears reach a certain level? The, a couple of questions there, if I can. One of the strange things to me is that the number of complaints to MPs has hardly moved over the period of this. So your experience that it's gone down and gone up again is probably, although a couple of other people have said it to me, a couple of MPs have said the same to me. I'd had a, and as, because they now looked at the monthly complaints to MPs over the last five years, and they're pretty much a thousand a month. Uh, all the way through that period. The highest was 1350, the lowest was 850. You know, June was very high for some reason, but it came off again in the autumn. So the number of complaints that we get directly from members of the public has fallen hugely. The, the, the total complaints has fallen by more than half, but the number coming through MPs is relatively flat, um, which probably is borne out by what you're saying, saying there. Um, and, and, and it surprised me when I, um, when I saw them, so I had assumed, perhaps naively, that you'd have a similar trend in the two, but I guess it's where there's a big problem like you, you're discussing, that people still go to, the, to their MPs. Our average arrears across the caseload is about 3,000 something. Uh, more than half of them are less than 1,000, 56% are less than 1,000, but then there are some very big ones. Typically the very big ones are um, uh, what they call uh, interim maintenance assessments, where to frighten people into giving us information, we made an estimate, a, a process that was used in the, in the 90s, we don't use anymore now. And about 1.2 billion, so almost a third of the total arrears, is these estimates. And most of the very big arrears are these figures which were deliberately made big in order to, uh, let's say, push people into providing data. It works for the revenue, apparently, but it hasn't worked for us. And when we eventually catch up with these people and get the information, typically we write down that calculation by about 70%, because the estimates were very high. We do actively work every case over certain thresholds, of, of which uh, I think we're at about 12,000. has got a team that goes after them, relatively small numbers. So we will be chasing those, uh, but it doesn't mean we get it. I mean, we, we have some success with these. We got 70,000 yesterday, which was, was a, a great one. We got 12,000 on Friday that settled off cases altogether. But these are arrears often dating back to the mid-90s. Uh, people may not have the income to support them, particularly if it was an estimate. Some of them have assets. The two I've just talked about were assets. One was a house, 
that we we had a possession order on, and the guy came up with the money. The other was a bank account that we found that he's uh, he just split up from another wife, uh, and the first <laughs> wife rang us up and said they've just sold the house with some money in his account, <laughs> and we took twelve thousand of it. And um, so, it, it, but it's at that sort of tactical level that you're operating. Uh, and this isn't a very good answer, I'm afraid, for your constituents, but big old arrears are very hard to collect. Uh, and our experience, which again you may have picked up in the report, we tried something which was putting out arrears to the private sector to see if they could do any better than we did. Uh, and the experience was pretty disappointing, really. They collected 26 million out of 350 million which we, um, which we put out. And that's not because well, these were two of the biggest four in the marketplace doing it. It was Eversheds and, and Icor. I used to be known as legal and trade, and it just shows how difficult it is to collect the arrears. Um, one of the other things we've done recently is, is had PricewaterhouseCoopers do a, a piece of work on, on the collectability uh, of the arrears, and one of the, they did half a dozen different methodologies which came with a range of answers, but one of the worst ones, if you actually credit scored <coughs> our non-resident parents and said would they get a loan for this amount of money, then the number of them that would was derived, they were tiny, tiny. Um, and, and that's what makes it so difficult to collect. So a lot of the numbers will end up being adjusted down, the very big ones. We do actively work all the very big ones, uh, and where there is an asset, we'll get it eventually. But um, you know, it, it is a difficult part, I understand. So you're saying there is a level at which an alarm bell will ring and a case yes. will pop out, and what yes. is that level? Well, there, there are different teams. So the, the, uh, it, the, as soon as there, there's three missed payments, we start chasing for the payments. So the, rather than just to remind us, we then have teams working over 50, over 25, over 50, and over 10, uh, and with different levels of, uh, of intensity, shall we say, looking at whether there are assets that we can get, thousands, or those were thousands, the, those numbers that we're talking Thank about. Thank you. And you mentioned about the, uh, the private collection agencies. In 2008-2009, you, your target was to collect £220 million pounds worth of arrears, and you collected only £158 million. Why was that target missed by 30%? Well, it, it, the total collections, including an element of arrears, was the target. And we made the total collections, but the mix between arrears and, um, and current was, was not <coughs> what we thought. The element that was missed was all from the, the uh, debt collection agencies. So when we let that business, you know, we, we, we tendered the, the debt and said, who can collect how much of this for how much? Then the estimates would get over 100 million back from them. And we got, as we said, 26. So the internal collections bit worked. The experiment, if you like, you know, the, the trial <coughs> team who could use this through the uh, private sector uh, didn't. And, and I think that says we need the special enforcement tools. It's not just a lack of activity that's the problem. But uh, so that, that's essentially why, that it was harder than, than we thought to collect that. But I, I would say, you know, we did the total, which was the actual target. We did hit the total. It was the mix between arrears and, uh, and current which was different, uh, and, and we, in fact we overachieved the, the total. So the impact on the, on the balance doesn't matter whether you've collected more arrears or more current, <coughs> obviously. You know, the, the balance of arrears owing, it, it's the total collections that affect them. Well, it matters to the individual because... It does. <laughs> it does, absolutely. I, what you said earlier about using uh, calculations, in a sense, in order to scare the, uh, the absent parent, I mean, it also lowers the parent with care into a false feeling of confidence that yeah. she, as it usually is, is going to get more than uh, yes. is, Sorry, she thinks she's going to get she's so get much and she's not, never going to get that. I think that's right. I mean, it hasn't been done for 10 years now, but these, these assessments are still out there. You know, there haven't been new ones for around 10 years now. It was, it was a 90s um, tactic which was used. We now use what we call a default decision where we actually say what is... Um, what, what, uh, trade is he in or what job is he in where does he work and we have tables of average incomes for occupations and we, we get the best evidence we can in other words where we just can't get the information although to be fair you know, to be honest sorry then the, the collection rate on those is, is also quite low you know, these are people who just aren't cooperating at all Right uh, we've, you've accepted that you've only collected 158 million against the 220 million target yeah. for last year and you've explained why but this year, your target is only 170 million, so you're not expecting to collect well, significantly that, more arrears right. than last year. No, that's right. So we, we've taken the, that book, book back from the uh, debt collectors now, so that their contribution um, was, was so small. Uh, to be honest, that, that 170 is a very difficult target. Uh, halfway through the year, that's looking tough. So you're taking back that from the debt collectors, but you've not put another method in. You've, you've not expressed well, we, any we, confidence we, that there'll be a significant increase in the amount of arrears that are collected this year. 
That's right. So the, the, the cases which are paying to the debt collectors, we've left there, I should say. So there's about 7,000 cases who are making payments. The rest we've taken back and we'll put into these teams that I've talked about to use the, the enforcement powers, the asset seizure powers and so on on them because we, I think it's demonstrated the commercial methods they use weren't effective. You've explained that only 1.065 billion of the nearly 3.8 billion that arrears are collectible. Is this entirely explained by those estimates that you were talking about, or is there another answer for that? Uh, no, we, we accepted the, uh, the blend of these different methodologies, which gave us answers from 400 and some to 1. You know, more than 1.3-ish, 1, uh, 1 1.2 something, uh, and decided that, that you know, given we have these powers that other people don't use, don't have, sorry, we should be able to get towards the top end of that range. Um, so that, that's re the methodology we used in the past, which was looking internally at a sample. Um, and saying, well, you know, if the case is, uh, if we know where the guy lives, we'll eventually get something. If he's in a job, we'll eventually get something. It was a less sophisticated method. Uh, and that is a, a revision to the uh, collectability. Thank you. I'll go on to enforcement. Okay. And uh, the difference between uh, what you had in the, in the um, uh, Child Maintenance Other Payments Act of 2008 and the Welfare Reform Act of 2009. <clears throat> the latter one substantially increased the administrative powers um, you had available, and particularly disqualification orders and, I believe, deduction orders as well. Why was that necessary so soon after the 08 Act? It was something the government wanted in the 08 Act and was uh, removed in the course of the passage of the bill, um, and the government decided it still wanted it and had a vehicle to get it. It was a result of negotiations as the bill was going through two houses. So the intention from the beginning was always to have those as administrative powers. Why that's so important is it, it allows you to do things in volume and quickly. There's an appeal to courts, but other uh, jurisdictions, um, particularly the driving licenses, particularly the US travel uh, documents, both the US and Australia, these things are done administratively. Uh, and in the, particularly in the US, again, in the, the case of driving licenses, it's the first thing they do. You get two reminder letters in Florida. The third letter says we've cancelled your driving license, and they find it very effective. So, if, if, and, um, so we have this protection built into the bill here that if somebody doesn't think they really owe it, they have an appeal to a court, a magistrate's court. But to put the whole thing through magistrate's courts has slows the process down and increases the costs. So you would, um, you would say that the main obstacles you've faced in terms of the court is, is the length of time. Are there any others? Uh, it, it's a more expensive process and it, it takes time, yes. What about the deduction orders? Could you talk us through what use you get made of those? We have a, um, well, the, the example of the £12,000 which I gave you a moment ago it was a deduction order. We've got a team of about 10 people at the moment who we're piloting deduction orders and, and the, the main banks have set up single points of contact and we've agreed a certain volume to test the process but clearly they have to find the, the accounts and do it. We, uh, we've um, done a, a couple of score of deductions. Uh, the biggest problem so far is actually identifying the bank accounts. So we don't have, a, as say the Americans would have, access to a federal database which lists all bank accounts and the balances for child support purposes. So we need to get intelligence, like in the example I gave, it was from the first wife who knew it was from the second wife, to say he's got an account at such a bank, and then we need to hit the exact title on the account. You know, so if he calls himself H. Stephen Smith rather than Stephen H. Smith, we probably wouldn't get a match. And, and we, this is what we're working through with these, these banks about. So, okay, you know, how... how um, precise as it need to be, have we got some we've missed, if we try a range do we put it there. So we're still in the pilot stage of doing it but we are taking you know, significant tens of thousands of pounds through these, this, uh, and it looks like it would be a good thing. The regular deduction, we've done a couple of regular deduction, I think that's probably less promising because we don't have the power for joint accounts or business accounts and clearly if you, if you want to avoid the deduction then get your mum to put a name on your bank account and uh, we can't touch it. But, so um, just for clarity on the numbers, you, you said you've done a couple of score of the first yes. time. Do you mean literally under 100? Yes, as in a couple yes. Of we, we, we've done many hundreds of requests for bank account details. So I can't give you a precise number, I'm sorry, but it'll be in the 1,000, 1,200 range. We go for a few weeks. But the actual hit on bank accounts is relatively small. So we get lots back saying, no, we haven't got an account for H. Stephen Smith. 
Um, all, uh, and uh, because we haven't got anything to compare it to, we have to accept that and move on. So it's the identifying bank accounts that's the issue. We know the bank account he's paid us from in the past if he's paid us, so we can see if there's any money in that and so on. But that, that's, I think um, the next thing we need to find a way of, of overcoming that. And we've talked to Experian, who um, maintain a database of credit accounts about getting lists of accounts from them, but they don't have accounts with, with positive balances in their current services. We'd have to try and work on that. They say in, in some other countries there is a database created for the purpose of, uh, of child support deductions, um, but we, we discussed that and didn't, it wasn't included in the bill. Is that a, just to pursue the, the point about the, the way the banks work with you in that? Is that a limitation on the banks that they have to uh, insight in terms of their own processes that they have to get, for example, exactly the correct uh, account name? Or are they presenting you with an obstacle? No, I, I don't think they're being obstructive at all. If, if you look at it from their point of view, the, the, you know, the, their customer has entrusted them with this money, and unless they could demonstrate to them they have no option, the customer is likely to be very... Um, you know, say disenchanted if they've said, oh no, we haven't gone for that, but we've got a couple that sound similar, would you like a look? <laughs> so I think that yep. the answer is to have somehow to have access to, to a better data so that mm -hmm. we can target. I, I wouldn't expect the banks to do you know, sort of fuzzy searches for us and say, what do you think about this? Although I'd very much like it if they were to volunteer. I think that would be, as an ex-banker myself, I think that would be a, an unreasonable thing to do. Just in terms of the, um, again, one more recap on the numbers. Um, I understand there's been a 12% decrease in the number of deductions from earnings orders since 06. Is that uh, The number of new ones we've put on, the number in place and working is higher than it's ever been. So we had a push to get them on. We took off ones which were ineffective. Uh, and we're, we currently have about 80% of deduction orders actually net money each month. And there's only 7% of the employed caseload, which is either hasn't got a deduction of earning order but isn't paying, which, which is kind of transit, so there's people in between jobs. So we, we've pretty well pushed the deduction of earnings orders up to where we'll get it to be effective now. So I think you know, the 12% is in the number of new ones we put on in the last period rather than the number that are in force. And it's the number that are in force and paying that's important. So the effective proportion has gone up from just over 70 to 81% now actually yield money because they're on the right employer for the right amount of money we keep them up to date uh, but the number of new ones we're putting on each month has fallen slightly okay. what, um, what progress have you made in the sense of testing those orders you know you're, we're, we're talking here about them as a new tool I suppose in some ways which have, have pros and cons um, so if, if it's I'm sorry which orders deduction orders deduction orders, orders, orders still what progress have you made in testing those as the first means of collecting maintenance? Uh, we haven't yet. I think we, we had a, a regulation from October to do that, to, so it's not an enforcement power anymore. It can be the first thing, and we, we, it, it's being worked through the CSA's internal processes now, so I'm afraid not yet. We can now do it, though. <coughs> Finishing up on deduction orders, the final one um, that, again, I, I've derived from even somewhat new um, constituency casework. A couple of cases come to my attention where it, see, it, it appears from the, the, the um, in this case, gentleman's point of view, that um, money seems to have been taken without him having had notice, and indeed a very large amount of money has been taken that has completely wiped out his account. Do you have, does those examples have any re resonance with you? Uh, no. So if, if the process had worked, I mean, if you want to let me have details, I'll, I'll look at them. The process was, he should we freeze it and notify him? and he has a period to appeal to us and if we reject it to a magistrate before we can go ahead. So if anybody has had them without notice, either he hasn't given us his latest address or we've not followed the process. And given the other side, it's ten people running this, I'd be more surprised than usual if we hadn't followed the process. Um, so the, 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 there is, say in, in, the, in the rules, there is an appeal to us and then an appeal on to a magistrate. And it's, it, we freeze first before we take. And you, so feel, we, you feel you'd have a high awareness of any errors occurring in that process? I, I'm not aware of any that, that that's happened with it. To be fair, you know, I, haven't, uh, I haven't seen a stat that says there have been none. But the, um, it, nobody should, they, they, they should be frozen without him knowing, because clearly there's not much point in you know, so we're about to freeze the account. And it, maybe that's what, what's actually happened, but you shouldn't take it without him knowing and having had a chance to appeal and a month to appeal, isn't it? Thank you.
I'm a bit, a bit longer in the tooth than I suspected. You may be lying. It <laughs> 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 happens, and I'm a lawyer, and um, we've, got, we've got quite a few exceptions. Anyway, um, um, <laughs> I'm promoting financial responsibility um, sees questions. In, in your operational improvement plan, you commit to running a media campaign to promote financial responsibility. Um, your pilot exercise appears to have been very successful, but since then nothing's happened. Um, what's happened? What is there any further action? The, um, there, there are two things, I think, that we're doing, one in terms of promoting uh, financial responsibility and the other in promoting information uh, support and guidance. And um, uh, what we're doing there on the, on the financial responsibility front, we're working with other government departments because it's pretty clear that this is something which across government um, we should be doing, in particular working with uh, um, the DCSF, um, looking at the way in which we might uh, work, are indeed are beginning to work through children's centres and the extended schools programme um, in Nottingham, at, um, working through the strategic partnership there, trialling out uh, curriculum materials uh, in, in one of the academies there. Um, we are also wanting to work um, through the uh, Department of Health with health visitors and with midwives to try and make sure that we um, get information to those people about our option service uh, because it is the option service which is really the outreach programme. Um, as I say, not only giving uh, information but also support and guidance um, to, to people to try to increase their um, awareness of their financial responsibilities and to help them uh, do that um, if, if we... Um, if we can. One of the ways of making sure that people know about the option service, of course, is to actually pub publicise it. And we have we trialled um, a media campaign in the, in the Midlands uh, just recently to see if we could, um, uh, through television and radio advertising, really bring to the public's awareness the fact that this option service was available to them. And in fact, it was very successful. Um, with uh, a very significant increases in the, in the numbers of people telephoning in, I think uh, uh, 50% 50, 50, 50 increases and 100% increase uh, in the numbers of people using web access to that service. Um, that, of course, is hugely important to us, not only uh, for those people who want to use the statutory service, but importantly, uh, the people who want to try and make private arrangements using our calculator, using the support of um, our, our, our colleagues in the options service. Um, so that we don't lose the very vulnerable people that we were talking about earlier. Um, and the other interesting thing um, that we learned that our publicity campaign was targeted not just at the parent with care, but also at the non-resident parent. And, and as well, um, because we're into behaviour change here, which is very long term, um, at the friends and families of those concerned. And one of the things that we know from behaviour change is that the things that changes your behaviour most um, is, is persuasion from, from families and friends. And the statistics from the central region programme that we, uh, advertising uh, campaign that we use for our option service, uh, demonstrated that um, non-resident parents too were beginning to use the service. 22% of our inbound calls um, were from non-resident parents, which was a, which is a very uh, significant increase, I think, on the two or three percent of NRPs who would normally have called the helpline at, at, at the CSA, and. Um, I think 13% of the calls were from family and friends. Now, it is terribly important that we let people know that this service is out there. When we originally piloted um, the, uh, the, the work with, through focus groups, a lot of uh, ex-CSA uh, customers said to us, we only wish this had been around when, when we were trying to make our arrangement. And, and so we need to make sure that people know that the option service is there and that it can help them. And so we're going to be extending that um, publicity campaign um, to the rest of the country uh, in, in the new year because it is clearly a very important plank of the way in which CMAC will work differently and the different services that CMAC will offer than, than the CSA could. So it's about promoting financial responsibility but that as I say must also be done through other government departments um, and we will be working as well with <coughs> CLG to see the way in which perhaps uh, local area agreements uh, might actually have something within them that can deliver for us the um, further information that parents need to have, particularly about our option service, which will then deliver um, the information, the guidance, and the support. We're also trialling within uh, our option service um, the, the ways in which uh, we can help and support private arrangements, but particularly arrangements with the most vulnerable. So we're looking at, for example, what kind of face-to-face -face support um, might be affordable and useful and work um, and, and, and people want. It's, 
immediately you think actually what the most difficult um, uh, situations and, and customers with greatest difficulty will want is a face-to-face -face contact. That isn't necessarily so. Um, so we're actually trialling uh, a number of different ways um, to see how we can best support the most vulnerable and, and indeed uh, s help people sustain their private arrangements so that they don't have to come back to the statutory service, although of course if it all breaks down um, they, they certainly can. I know the um, FSA now have a baby pack that every newborn baby gets. Mm. Um, are you part of that? Are you in there? Uh, with the FSA and the Money Made Clearer um, documentation, we are involved with the FSA with our information uh, in that. We're also um, in the information that the um, Kids in the Middle um, uh, organisation runs with Agony Arts actually now um, increasingly referring people to our option service and that, that awareness of the option service and actually um, really making sure that everybody at every level who has contact um, with parents, as I say parents with care and non-resident parents importantly, uh, is aware of, of the help and support that they can actually have. How, how are you measuring the success of that, and is there anything in benchmark? Because you know the CSA has got such a bad name. You get sure. parents word of mouth at the moment is don't go near the CSA because everything was fine until they did. Um, how are you going to change yeah. that that sort of yeah. public perception as well? Well, changing the, to, to answer the second one, but changing the pu the public perception, I think in the end, will it'll be success that changes it, and the fact that people are getting help and support from options by word of mouth, I think is, is probably in the end the biggest thing that changes things, is, is people's positive experience. And we know from the um, uh, initial in-house surveys that we've been doing that actually we are getting very, very positive responses uh, from um, the, the uh, people who have used options. We're doing three sorts of things. We have a, we're beginning a comprehensive uh, piece of work that will be uh, an annual survey, a longitudinal survey too, involving uh, about 12,000 uh, uh, sets of parents in the, in the first instance because we need to first of all baseline um, and then um, every year to measure the effectiveness of our, of our option service. So that is actually beginning. We will get a first report, I think, by about March next year, which will give us the baseline of the numbers of people uh, making um, private arrangements as a result of, of their involvement with options. And we will then follow that through on an annual basis with about a third of, of those, both parents with care and non-resident parents. But because we wanted something... Um, Sooner than that, and the board was very keen to know what options has been in, 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 in place now, is there something that we can do internally? We actually set up um, an internal client surveys immediately um, to phone clients of op options, people who had themselves um, phoned in uh, uh, or been in contact with us, to say, um, you know, what kind of arrangement have you made since your contact with options? And we have... Uh, we now know from those internal surveys um, that, that something over 60,000 children have, been, uh, have had money passed to them because their parents have actually been helped by the option service and that's about 38,000 arrangements since the option service has been in business. So a major longitudinal study which will start, which has started and we will have the baseline figures by March but uh, more immediately um, the um, uh, the internal surveys are showing us that it is working. When there's a marital or relationship breakdown, the, the first stop for the couple separately or together is not CAB or, or some of the other um, agencies <coughs> you mentioned, it's actually the lawyer. So are you targeting lawyers to make sure that, um, that they know what the new system is and what, how it would work? Because I still find lawyers now who sit on CSA cases realise they can't do anything with it, and then they send them to me. Um, and um, and by the, in the meantime, it's cost the client or my constituent quite a lot of money that very often they don't have. Yes, indeed. We, we um, work very closely with a number of, of stakeholders, including Resolution, uh, the, the uh, family lawyers' uh, uh, organisation. We also, um, realising that the role of the lawyer in all of this was, could be quite key, and when I was recruiting non-executive members of our board, recruited a very senior family lawyer um, so that we actually had advice um, directly every month when we meet, as well as the, uh, the in-between meetings that we, that we have with lawyers um, through, through our stakeholder relationships uh, with resolution and, of course, with those who, who provide mediation. The, the other thing that's come in, um, which had, was slightly controversial as well, is the joint registration of births. Um, is that having an impact in fostering the whole sense of parental financial responsibility, particularly um, in the case where the, the, the parent perhaps has never really been very much in the child's life from the off? 
Uh, to be honest, we don't know. Um, it, it, it was something that was in the legislation um, along with all of the things that had to do with CMEC. Um, it may, it may not. Of course, the difficulty about it is it, it, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that the name on the birth certificate certificate is actually the father, uh, because it's the PwC who puts the name there. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a bit of a blunt instrument, I think. Yeah, so I, I don't think it's actually enforced. It was in the Welfare Reform Bill. Yeah, it was just gone through. So, I don't think it's not started well, yet. Yeah. All right, so do you think it's going to make a difference then, or, or do you think you're just going to have a lot more I, I agree with uh, you, DNA tests? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I don't think it'll, it'll make a lot. The DNA tests, we do a DNA test in about one in a hundred. Yeah. Um, so it, it's not a a huge problem. Dispute of paternity isn't a huge thing that, that we deal with. I don't think this will make much difference to that. I think the, the potential positive side, as Janet said, said, we don't really know yet, but as you suggested, is if actually it is joint and he was involved, you know, he, he knew his name was being put on, and he is, it does make him want to be more part of the mm -hmm. child's life, then he's probably more willing to do it, but I, I don't think we've got any uh, evidence to say it will make a big difference to us yet, and, and I don't think it will make any difference to the number of disputes, uh, on paternity, which is already quite small. Mm. I've got a case at the moment where the, he thought somebody, by just ignoring the whole request for uh, the, the paternity proof, that it would somehow go away, and of course it hasn't. Well, we do get <laughs> some, yes, but it's, it is, it's one, and one in five, he turns out not to be the father, so it's one in 500 is, is the incidence of, of wrong you know, naming by the parent with care, which is pretty small. Well, it might be years of thinking, think, think, thinking somehow yes. that, that, that the request would, would, yeah. would, would go away. Yeah. So, anyway, sorry, I'm finished. Okay. Can you, uh, we've given us some, a lot of information about the option service, but could you give us some more detail? For example, uh, how many staff are in it? What expertise do they have? What locations are there for the face-to-face -face, uh, interviews? Is a telephone service a personal one or is it a call centre? Um, what's on uh, your website, for example, those tables you referred to of sample incomes, is that on? Is there a link for texting, for emails on that? Uh, can you tell us something? I'll, I'll, I'll give you some information and perhaps Stephen will come in with uh, <coughs> uh, as well. I think we've got 250 people, uh, or, or the, the op option of using up to 250 people. Um, and they are based, um, I know you have to catch a train uh, to, to Leeds and then go on a long car no journey, or you, could, or you could in fact catch a train to Sheffield and go, so it's, it's, it's up, it, it's up at... What on the... What on the... There we are. That, that is where um, we have separately commissioned uh, a new organisation um, through Ventura to actually offer uh, this service. And what um, impressed me when I went up to see how they recruited the people um, that they would... Uh, use on their on their helpline was that they they recruited from a new but also from among uh, call centre staff people who um, the ad, as the advert said you don't have to be a social worker to help children and so they recruited people who really wanted to be in the business of helping uh, people to make maintenance arrangements. We then um, they then. Uh, themselves uh, have to go through a pretty thorough training program, not the standard sort of two weeks for call centre, um, but, but a significant uh, number of weeks, not just of the, the basic training, uh, but also then of, of practice uh, online. And that training has been uh, written for us and carried out for us by a number of our stakeholder groups who are people themselves um, who are used to working uh, in, in, the, in the field with, with the kinds of customers that we will deal with. So we're, we are very confident and very pleased with, with uh, the work that has gone there in recruiting the appropriate people and training them. One of the other things that I think um, impressed us as a board was that when we went to listen in and when any of you were to go and listen in or our stakeholders, they are then very uh, um, keen to hear our comments and to put things right. So, for example, in the very beginning, we were so keen that people should get impartial information that there was a concern that we might not be giving as much guidance uh, as customers might like. And therefore, it was possible um, to actually change the, uh, the, the script and the text uh, that was used. And of course, also when you watch and hear um, our, our colleagues who work there, while they have a script and a text, actually what they do um, is, to, is have a conversation with people using that, uh, not literally um, a reading out a text, but using that in a very different way. The, um, we have, perhaps you would talk to um, Stephen about the technical links that we have and also our, our plans in the future to, to use uh, text messaging and so on to actually reach people much more efficiently. Okay. Yeah, um, Janet says the contract allows up to 250 people 
in a room. I, I, I don't quite understand the aversion to call centres. So it's, it's a call centre in the sense that it's a lot of people on telephones in a room, but they're, they're not kids off the street. You know, they're all people who, who are fairly mature, who have been tested psychologically as well as technically on, on whether they can be empathetic, whether they understand these sort of issues. So they've had a big training. There are actually 160, I think four, 160 at the moment, which is what we need to cope with the volume. Uh, they're in, in Wathan Dern, which is terribly important. They do do an email service, not a texting service at the moment, but you can email them, they'll email back. Uh, because it's open 68 hours a week, then we don't give, you, you always talk to the same person, but there's a record of, of the calls if the caller wants to leave one. So they're, they're given a choice of being anonymous or saying who they are. If they say who they are, they, they get a code number, a security number, so that if, if they, they use quote that, anybody else they talk to can come back to them. It's the email as possible. The face-to-face -face people visit you either in your own home or they'll make an appointment to meet you in, in a local job centre. So there are about 50 of them, uh, and they're scattered around the country. We, we planned it at the beginning so we had you know, reasonable coverage. The, the usage of it has been very low, the take-up's been very low, uh, and so we have taken um, uh, reduced the coverage a little bit. But we've done some pilots to actively promote it, and we'll, we'll continue to do those things. Th there's a knowledge base which the, uh, the telephone workers work on, which is pretty much the same as you get when you go on the website, uh, but we can see what they've discussed with the client because of the, the bits of the knowledge base they've accessed while they're in there. They are probably too neutral at the moment, so virtually every, if you look at the uh, talking about legal uh, solutions, talking about private solutions, and talking about the statutory scheme, the numbers are virtually the same. Virtually everybody gets told about them all. We're encouraging them to, to guide more and say, well, you know, if you really can't talk to him and, and you think he might be violent, then go to the CSA, you know, don't, don't do that. But we're stopping short of, of actual advice. I think there was one other question you asked and I've lost it. Oh, the, the tables. Table. No, they're not. They're not. Now, whether they should be, I've never thought about putting them on, but the, the, the answer is the guy. Yes. Guy. Yes. yes. We, um, I don't know whether we own them and could publish them, but we'll, we'll look at it. It's, I've just never thought of them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, awareness was, is very low. The publicity campaign improved that you know, for that short while in that area. You're going to do that um, nationwide, so hopefully awareness will go right up, will those arrangements and the staff you've got be able to cope if there's a big surge, that's the current <laughs> word isn't it, a surge. Conversations we were having within, just last week. <laughs> within the 250, because they have people, so Ventura on that site have 5,000 people. Uh, and they do all sorts of things there including um, some work on pension credit, they deal with the complaints to Sainsbury's chief executive that if you ring the RSPCA and say there's an injured deer, you're actually ringing Wathander and Ventura who then talk you through it and, and deal with it. So th they, they have people who can move in to, to get those numbers up. Um, we have worked out what we think is likely to be the impact given what it was last time um, and we do lots of outbound calls at the moment which we can manage. So we do, um, so the, the people who, who've uh, made benefit claims or tax credit claims, we outbound tens of thousands uh, a week. So we can stock that back to balance the demand. So we're pretty confident. And, we, and the plus the, the advertising, we're booking it you know, on a month at a time, a rolling month. So if it's, oh, if it's, it's down to sinkers, then we can, we can step back the volume a little bit and spread it out a bit. So you know, we've thought about plan that we think would be okay. Okay. I, I, Every case is different, I suppose, but uh, uh, just if I tell you this scenario, which is, I think, a pretty common scenario, can you tell me how that will be dealt with? Generally, not a great uh, long thing, but uh, just generally, a couple of, well, at least a man was a high earner, or at least one of them was a high earner, and unemployment strikes. How will the auction service... Uh, with options? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, and, and is there already an arrangement in place in, well, in this scenario? Yeah. So well, they, were, they suddenly break up. Oh, they break up because there's an employee. Mm. And they would explain, I think, that, what it, that if they went to the CSA, what the assessment would be would be linked to his income. So it wouldn't be a lot now, but then you'd keep an eye on whether he went back into work. And they would probably say, I'd hope they would say, that if you make a private arrangement, you can go broader than income. And, and if, if, having been a high earner, he's retained some money, then there's no reason he shouldn't contribute something out of that. Uh, but they would then, 
you know, suggest you can either talk to him or use a lawyer and they could refer you to the legal uh, services, um, community legal services, I'm sorry, is one of the signposts on that we have. So the, the, the big signposts on are the CSA, uh, Relate, and Shelter Line, and then the legal services, the Community Legal Services Commission. So the, the signpost the calls on afterwards. Thank you for that. Can I uh, just ask you about uh, the two roles of being an independent advisory service and then an enforcement agency that you've got overall? Um, are they compatible? At a, the, the, at a commission level, I think they are because <coughs> they're part of the overall levers that you need to pull to achieve this objective of maximising the number of people who have effective arrangements. I, I would never suggest we would have the same individual people or even the same brand providing those services. So one of them you're talking to child maintenance <laughs> options and the other you'll be talking to the child maintenance enforcement service under a different brand. It'll be different people, trained differently and so on. But for to have a, a controlling mind somewhere that decides what the balance of investment you know, amongst the different services that you offer should be and coordinates messages, I, I think it is compatible. You know, certainly from a customer-facing entity, it's not and needs to be kept separate. Uh, and, and that's exactly how we're architect. I know there was a lot of concern, um, I, I think... Uh, when the option service was, was first uh, mooted, that, that it couldn't be seen as independent. I think uh, it, it's demonstrably seen by people as something that's helpful. I, I actually think that, you know, as the years go by, people will just see child maintenance. I hope they will see it as something which is supportive um, and that has at the back end, albeit under a separate brand, within the overall umbrella, um, as, as uh, you know, the, the tool to be used if all, if all goes wrong. And hopefully, if we get some of the other work that we're doing right, there will be less need um, to, to use as much of our, of our, of our enforcement. It's interesting weight. with, with the um, publicity we did as well in the Midlands, that, that one of the big things that they talked about at the beginning was who we are and why we can help. Mm -hmm. And people didn't know who the heck options were. Mm -hmm. But as we went through that phase in the summer when we were advertising, the percentage of calls that had that content really fell. Mm -hmm. So that the people who were coming in as a result of the publicity understood what it was. A lot of them had been on the web before the rang and, and you sort of thought about what they wanted to talk about, what further they needed. Uh, and a lot more of them were non-resident parents. So we, get very, we had very few non-resident parents calling before the campaign. 22% of the people who rang after the campaign were non-resident parents, and 13% were families and friends. People, you know, my, my sister's this, my brother's that, and so on. So the, the, um, which is one of the reasons we're planning to do it, to get to, to, to more of the people involved in the overall um, you know, discussions around a family breakup. Again, when we talk about our audience being current and potential separated parents and their influencers and supporters is the audience we want to get to options and that campaign did do quite a bit of work on that which is why we're rolling it out Just, uh, I mean this is my last question really is the options will give advice on private agreements uh, but sometimes all sorts of things are going on between the, part, the yes. two main parties sometimes intimidation and there may not be an equal bargaining power. How do you cope with, you know, cope with that? But, uh, because presumably you're getting uh, uh, the application from one, just one side, maybe. And I wonder, it, I nearly wrote down the question, whose side are you on? Uh, how do you deal with that whole, that whole point of perhaps there not being equal bargaining power? I think it's, really, it's just really important to say that we're not on anybody's side. We're on the, if, if, if there is a side to be on, it is actually the child, because actually it's about getting money moving um, to, the, to the child through the parent with care. And so it's really very important um, that our option service deals equally with non-resident parents and parents with care, uh, and indeed helps their family and friends um, with all of that. Now, um, we're not in the business of, of counselling. Um, that's not our main our main role is to actually get the money moving but of course we are working with key stakeholders and we can refer people to to relate for example if actually what they really need to do is to get other things sorted out and, and of course when you break up it isn't just child maintenance what we know however is that child maintenance often gets left to the last thing on the list so one of the things that we're trying to do is to shift it up the list of the things that gets dealt with we also know from from uh, surveys over the past that Everybody says that what they want to do is to make sure that money gets to children. It's just when, it, when the breakdown actually happens, um, attitudes change. So some of our work in relation to financial responsibility has got to be about 
uh, got to be something that we can refer and fall back on uh, in in those in those cases. Um, but it's you know in the end of the day um, we have to work very very uh, closely with the uh, our, our stakeholder groups who we can then refer people to um, to to help sort out some of those other complicated problems that uh, that can occur at the same time. But we can't be on anybody's side; it would be wrong, except the side of the child who who is the recipient of the money. That's helpful. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, uh, my questions are about your responsibility to provide a statutory maintenance service. But the first two questions I want to ask, you've already covered, but, but, I'm, but being a politician, that's not going to stop me asking the questions again, just to make sure that we, you've given all the information that you want to give. Um, the first one, uh, in answer to, to questions raised by, by the Chair, was about whether or not you had uh, sufficient funding uh, to, to launch the new statutory scheme in, in 2011. And then uh, when Jenny Willett was asking you questions, uh, she, she raised the issue about the transitional period between 2011 and, and uh, 2014. And again, you, you linked your answers to whether or not you would have enough money um, and that... Um, if there were any future cuts to your uh, funding, that you may then have to um, uh, extend the period uh, of transition. Perhaps you could just tell us a little more um, about that period of, of transition and whether or not um, uh, the, the old and the current schemes will still be managed in that period, ha how you will affect that, whilst at the same time uh, encouraging people on to the new scheme. Yes, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try and then uh, Stephen again may, may come on with, in with the, the, uh, the, the figures. Um, but um, uh, essentially our timetable of having the new scheme ready 2011, 2011 still holds and the transition uh, that we've planned to, uh, uh, to have finished uh, by the end of 2014 absolutely depends on the, uh, the budget plans that we have laid out. Uh, you, you can't produce 70% efficiencies and that's 30% real uh, uh, reduction um, with, uh, without a certain amount of uh, baseline agreement and um, it has been difficult enough to get that baseline agreement frankly uh, as, as we speak let alone um, face up to what might, what might well be pressure to cut that money even further if the uh, funds are reduced we have to look at a number of different ways of, of handling that and one of the, uh, the biggest um, uh, uh, um, I guess variables is the rate at which we transition people from the uh, current systems, the, the two current systems, uh, to the new scheme because of course it is transition that costs the money um, for two sorts of reasons. One, the amount of help that you need to give people um, to make that transition. They will have to close their case and then actually have to reapply in order to bring about the, cl the clean break uh, that, that government intended. Um, and secondly, of course, you need to have people working on the new scheme um, at the same time as people continuing to work the old schemes. And so you have actually got, if you were to draw a graph, you'd actually have a peak in the numbers of staffing um, at exactly the moment when we're probably going to uh, be most hard-pressed in relation to, to public expenditure. And so what you would be doing is, if you like, moving that peak of staffing further down the road, taking longer, and actually therefore costing more to the public purse if you were to delay transition. And so our, um, our skill in negotiating with our, our sponsor department has got to be to try and help them see that actually the greatest savings to the public purse actually come by leaving the investment where it is because actually delays are not only not good for the, the, uh, our customers but actually not good in terms of the overall costs. You simply push them away and actually then they increase, not to decrease. But perhaps you could put some uh, sums on that. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 to be clear on the position on funding, the, the, I'm sure you already know this, but the way it works is we had a business plan which was submitted to the Treasury for, on a 10-year basis to cover the whole reforms, uh, and on the basis of that, things went ahead. But you only actually get a budget when it was for three years at a time. So we had the first three years' budget. That's now coming back to a one-year budget. So we've been told money that we didn't spend or don't spend this year, we can't keep for next year. So the, the actual you know, chunks have been, have been reduced. And we've no idea at all, really, what we'll get in the following year, which is when we start to get into transition, because that spending review period hasn't, hasn't happened yet. And clearly there's going to be pressure 
on, on public finance. So if we do get the original amount that was in the um, business case that went to the Treasury, you know, we thought it was tough but achievable, as I say, you know, tight, but we could do all, all the reforms. If because of the pressures and priorities which pertain at that time, you know, the expenditure review uh, dictated, we get less money, then we'll have to look at what we can achieve over what period. But the, the original intention, as Janet says, was it was a supported transition. So we actually, you know, went to people quite proactively. So we kept payment as continuous as possible, saying your CSA case is coming to the end because it's closing down. You've got some choices you can make. Would you like some help with making the choice? And, and actually, you know, follow that up so nobody just dropped out by default. Um, and then help them make a new application or a private arrangement, that, that you start looking at options like just moving the caseload across. But then that, of course, means you've got a bigger caseload to manage than you might have in the future. So th this challenge that, that Janet mentioned between what does it cost you in the particular years you're managing it, you might be able to push that down a bit, but the net of that is you'll spend more over the full year of the reforms because you don't get to single caseload with only people who want to be on it on an efficient system with the new powers in time. On your question, how what would you do with the current schemes? The, the plan is that yes, we continue to manage them. That as as we build up a caseload under the future scheme, we move people across from the CSA into it. So we're running the CSA is dropping down, and the new service is building up, uh, and also building up a residuary service which deals with the arrears that are left behind on the CSA cases and supplement that with some uh, uh, private sector contracting for the transition period when we have the need for these extra people. So that there's no intention of just leaving the um, cases which are already in, in, um, in flow, if you like, uh, to, you know, to wither on the vine while we build a new one. We will manage both the performance of those schemes and the transition between them uh, all the way through. Well, one of the uh, recurring theme in your answers this morning has been um, the importance of the new arrangements with HMRC. Uh, given how important that will be for the future scheme, uh, have you had any pilots? Have you tested these arrangements? Uh, no, but we're getting close to it. So, so the HMRC have agreed, um, you know, we've agreed with them, the data we need and we'll get. They've built their end of that interface and that database. Uh, it's, a, it, it's not released yet, but it's, it'll be going into test after Christmas. So we will test that. And we, we're confident that that can be done. Uh, the, the question always with these things is just how many people that we're dealing with are they also dealing with. And, and we did samples um, when we came up with the policy, and between DWP records and tax records, we thought we could cover over 90% of NRPs. But, of course, when you actually get there, not, not all our people are economically active, so we'll put it that way, you know, the, our case, I shouldn't smile as I say, but the caseload split between benefit, employed and self-employed doesn't add up to 100% uh, in child support um, NRPs. But uh, even, even amongst those who are economically active, um, there are some who uh, give inaccurate data to the inland revenue, yes. and so it won't help you if you, well it, well, it won't help the child uh, uh, if you are simply working on data that uh, that doesn't actually reflect the income. And, and we as Members of Parliament have, have had lots and lots of cases over the years, mainly with people who are self-employed. And, um, uh, and, and the, the government over the years has, has um, remedied some of the anomalies. Uh, for example, I seem to recall um, uh, that there were people who previously had been employed, became self-employed and were paid by dividends. And then uh, and those dividends were not uh, taxable income within your framework, um, and that has been altered. But but I, I've had lots of instances over the years of, of people whose lifestyle quite clearly is yes. way over way beyond the amount of income that they're declaring to, to the revenue, and it's a hugely cumbersome process for for me as a member of parliament and indeed the the parent with care who has to go through. Um, all sorts of hoops to get the inland revenue to do a fraud investigation to then uh, find out what, what the true income is. So I just wonder, when you're looking at, at the regulations that will underpin your, this, this relationship, whether you're taking that into account as well? Well, fundamentally, I mean, 
sorry, start again. We, we will start off by saying what's the revenue got about you? And, and, and your example of people paying in dividends would, would be a director of a, of a closed company, typically a company he controls, and he can decide whether to pay himself in salary or in dividends, and that's covered. And that would also be covered with data we can get from the revenue because it would be on his self-assessment tax return, whichever way he got it. So we'd, we'd pick that particular one up automatically. If it's a question of fraud you know, rather than uh, of uh, manipulation of income between different categories, so he's actually not telling about it at all, then it'd still be very difficult. Uh, and ultimately, somebody has to do a, an assessment of income for whatever purpose. Uh, and we aren't planning to set up a parallel income establishment unit when the revenue already does it. Part of the drive of the reforms is that we should um, you know, step aside from that and that's where most of the reduction in, in work that we have to do will have to do comes from. We do however think that uh, and I, I have had a meeting with the revenues uh, enforcement director about this to, to, to try and build in into the relationship a trigger where if you know somebody says to the guy to do his books, I know he earns twice that much, that we build that into the investigations the revenue would do. And it's open to the parent with care, as it is now, to, to make a, an application for a variation on the grounds that the income you know, must be higher than that. But some, somebody has to prove it you know, to the satisfaction of a judicial tribunal, effectively. But, 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 but there are also instances where, where it's, not, it's not fraud, it's actually having a very good accountant uh, who then um, uh, puts in all sorts of allowable expenses that, that then mean that the taxable income at the end of the day of somebody who is actually living a very affluent lifestyle is, is negligible because all the money is tied up in the company. Um, and, and what you're doing then in your links with the inland revenue wouldn't, wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't remedy that at all. And I think that will continue to be difficult. I think we're talking about very small numbers now. Both of, it's important if you're one of them, but it's yeah. very small numbers of people, but no, it wouldn't. And that's his income. You know, it's, it's, his income is what's left after his, if he's self-employed, you know, after the business has, has paid its expenses. If they are allowable expenses, that, I guess that's legitimate. And, uh, just just uh, finally on, on the inland revenue, we're, we're, when Select Committee did a, a report on this matter, we highlighted that, the, that there could be uh, a delay of up to two years in the information that the Inland Revenue had and that, that, that then they were sharing with you. And we, we had reassurances that, that, there were, that there would be opportunities for uh, either the, the non-resident parent or the parent with care to come up with more accurate, uh, up-to-date information. Is that the case? Yes, it is. So the, the, the underlying principle is that over the, even if you don't, if, it were, you know, if we didn't let them change it on flight as it were, which we are going to, then over the life of the case it's going to be pretty well right because you might be charging the amount in the wrong year but you're charging pretty much the right amount over the 10 years of a case and so on. But if there's a big gap develops between the historic income and the current income that we're using, sorry, the historic income we're using and the current income they have, then as you say, either parent can ask for a change of circumstances and we'll put it onto current income. Uh, and just finally, the, uh, the 12 month rule. Again, in our report, we had lots of evidence from a, a wide variety of people that it acted as a disincentive uh, to parents to reach private uh, agreements. Now, the government um, maintained the existing system. What, have you had any experience that, that it actually does get in the way of efficient operation of, of the CSA? I don't know that we have in relation to the, to the CSA, and I think, I think um, the way we look at it in the future is that uh, um, at the end of 12 months, of course, people make their private arrangement, and, uh, and if, we're, if we're looking at a, C, um, um, if we're looking at, uh, a whole new ball game where the, where the business is to try and help people make and keep uh, those private arrangements, then, then, the, then after the, the 12 months is up, that is the time when they could come to a, an arrangement that is uh, more suitable uh, between them, or indeed come back. Um, to the state system. I think strictly it's consent orders and it's court orders we're talking about rather than purely private uh, arrangements. So the 12-month rule doesn't apply to a private arrangement uh, and I think it's the essence of a private arrangement that you can change any time one of you wants to. You know, you can, you can, if you don't no longer agree then it's, it's an informal arrangement between you. If, if it's a consent order which is where the 12-month rule comes in, it's something you agreed and the court endorsed at a point and is binding. I think the um, it may put some people off consent orders. The, the evidence we have to date is that what it does, it means it's very likely the consent order amount will be pretty close to the statutory formula amount because then that takes away the risk and that the overall agreement that the separating couple make 
uh, it treats the ongoing maintenance and whatever else the assets in a way that the maintenance doesn't get mixed up with transfer of assets. Because you should sometimes yeah. say, because if, if they, one of them does come to the CSA, then whatever they've agreed gets supplanted. So effectively, it drives people who are using the court to come to the same arrangement the statutory scheme would do, which is, has got to be quite a good thing in, in some ways. So the government was very clear it wanted to maintain it, and certainly, you know, it's not really for us to say whether we you know, think that was right or not, but we haven't any evidence to suggest it's caused us problems. Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you, Chair. Um, rather neatly, really, to go back to um, the very first question, or the second question, actually, I think, that the Chair asked, um, is really this issue of uh, our concerns that we've already expressed previously about non-resident parents avoiding uh, their responsibilities. Um, and I really want to just, just pick up on that and ask you what steps you're taking to monitor the repeal of Section 6. Um, and what safeguards are, are in place to protect vulnerable <coughs> parents who may, as a result of that, end up with, without any maintenance arrangements at all? The research that we're doing, uh, that, uh, that I talked about, the longitudinal research, I think that is actually going to establish a baseline of the numbers of people who have uh, arrangements of different kinds. What we will be able to do there, of course, is to then compare back um, with the, uh, the numbers of people who um, were uh, on benefit and therefore um, statutory um, uh, members of the, of the CSA in the past. We will be able to monitor, therefore, the numbers of people who are making private arrangements, uh, whether that number differs from the numbers of people who made private arrangements um, before the repeal of Section 6. One of the things I think we sometimes forget is that only if, if, only if you were on benefit um, were you obliged to use the CSA, that everybody else, in fact, could choose in any case whether or not to use the CSA. So what has happened with the repeal of Section 6 is that people on benefit now have the same choice. So what we've got to measure is actually what happens um, to those people on benefit to see whether if they choose private arrangements and they make a private arrangement which they believe is effective, they manage to sustain them or they need to come back to the state system. That's something that we'll monitor through the longitudinal study. Uh, say by March we should have the baseline established and then we will check that out on an annual basis. In terms of safeguards, it is the way in which we use and develop, I think, our, our option service and the way in which we work with our stakeholder groups that we refer to um, and the way in which we publicise the fact that people can come straight back to us. It's got to be a very important message um, that if it's not working, it's okay, come back, and that there is no, uh, you know, no shame, no detriment. Um, you may try to make it work and it hasn't, or you try to make it work and actually you're now under threat, then come back, the, the, the system is there um, to help you. And we've got to get that message, I think, out uh, in a very simple and clear way that uh, there will be a system there that, will, uh, that you can revert to. And we do promote the people who were previously caught by Section 6, uh, in other words, people who are making a new benefit claim, when they make the benefit claim now, the benefit advisor says to them, have you worked a child maintenance arrangement? If they haven't, or if they have, they have it with you, if they haven't, they get an options leaflet and say, would you mind if options ring you? And you know, we do make these calls and we try nine calls and if we still haven't got through, we send them a letter saying, we try a number of times to do this and so on. Plus tax credit claimants uh, who are in separated families, we get a referral from HMRC and we contact them as well. Same basis, they're asked if, if they mind, it's an opt-out contact. So we are trying to follow up people who were previously dragged in. But I, I think, just supporting what Janet said, you, you can exaggerate how much good that Section 6 thing did, because if neither parent wants to cooperate, the chances of getting to a compliant arrangement are actually quite small. You know, the, the charm of the current arrangement is at least one of the parents wants a CSA case. And we got lots of uh, criticism, which, which I at least could understand, and particularly under the old scheme, but to a lesser extent under, under the second scheme, where there actually was a private arrangement, and, and you know, the, the, the parent with care was working, she was getting whatever, you know, £10, £5, £20 a week from the father of the children, and then she lost her job, went on benefit, and that money disappeared into the state. Uh, and you know, both parents resented that. And with the second scheme, she would have kept £10 of it. So we were interfering in private arrangements, not for the benefit of children, but for the benefit of the state, where they, they you know, didn't really want us to. And, and there was quite a lot of wrong, bad feeling about that. And of the 20,000 or so people who every month were forced to come to the CSA, only 30% actually got a calculation. 
because the rest closed the cases as soon as they came off benefit. And most people run off benefit very quickly. So if we look now at people going through options who are making an arrangement either with the CSA or with, the, with a private arrangement, it actually comes to more than we get in calculations beforehand. And so you know, I think we, we, there isn't a, a sort of a guarantee underwritten, but we are targeting our support to those more vulnerable people, and, and we, you know, we measure the, um, the success both of private and, uh, and, and statutory elements as much as we can, and, and there isn't anything that says there are fewer people benefiting because of it. Okay, thank you. Um, turning to the, the operational improvement plan, um, there was a target in there, and I think uh, a lot of us are fairly cynical about targets, particularly when they uh, seem to be conveniently forgotten about. And the target aimed to lift 40,000 children out of poverty, but now you're telling us you can't say whether you've achieved that or not. So wh why not, and what on earth was the point of a target that you then tell us you can't tell us if you've achieved? I I'm not sure we've said we couldn't tell you that, have we? No, I don't think so. Well, you certainly haven't said if you've achieved it or not. I'm saying it, sorry? You, you, you certainly haven't said if you, you've achieved it or not, and it, it appears from our, our evidence that you can't tell us whether or not that's been achieved. So when you say we've said it, it's in the, your briefing papers? I, I don't the, think... The, the evidence that we have been given... Okay, so, so you're not suggesting we've said this, but I'm sorry. Just, well, I mean, uh, if you can tell us if you've achieved well, it, I that, think that, the, that'll be, that'll sorry, be tremendous. The, given that we delivered everything that we said we would, the money and children numbers, then I think we would say that we'd, we'd have achieved that. Could we tell you which 40,000 children are lifted? No, we couldn't because we don't monitor the household income of our recipients. We, we assess on the household income of the payer rather than the recipient. So the, I think what the risk improvement said was that, this would, that if this plan was delivered, it would lift that number of children, and it, it's based on the, you know, the distribution of households who are uh, receiving money. But I couldn't count the, you know, tell you exactly the number. Um, but, we would the, but I think it was the case, wasn't it, that you know, if, as you say, if the targets had been reached, that the, those that uh, set the policy said that in their estimate um, that would be the number of children. Indeed, I think um, uh, together with the benefit disregard, um, it was 100,000 uh, uh, children lifted out of poverty. And uh, I think, uh, um, given that we have achieved all of the, uh, the targets of the OIP and the benefit disregard um, was at £20 last year, and in fact we managed to... Um, win the argument that it should be a total disregard as from next year and um, that, will, that will further increase uh, the numbers of children lifted out of poverty. I think the, uh, the, the estimate there rather than target is by a further 100,000 children. So I think the whole move is in the correct direction but I don't think it was a kind of target in terms of you know, which numbers where. It was an estimate by our, uh, the people that were looking at the policies as to how many more children would have benefited uh, over a particular line that they, that they would have drawn as a poverty line. Yeah, I, think, I think there's some confusion here. I think we need to try and uh, work this out um, because the, the, op the Operation Improvement Plan set out to lift 40,000 children out of poverty by March 2009. But according to the information that we've had, CMEC are reporting now that, be that because this figure is small relative to the expected annual variations in poverty <coughs> statistics and because of the inherent difficulties in associating changes in poverty levels with the specific policies enacted, you cannot validate whether this target was achieved. So again, I have to put the question back to you. You know, it, it, I mean, I mean, yeah, okay. in, in, es in essence, was was it achieved or wasn't it? Because that's clearly what we want to know. And if it wasn't, then why are you setting out saying that you know the plan was to lift forty thousand children out of poverty? Okay, I think the what do I think? We delivered what we said. If the if that comment that it would lift forty thousand children out of poverty was accurate then, then we could say we'd, we'd achieved it. Whether we can give you a um, specific measure that says you know, these are the children and therefore we can count them, then clearly we can't. But it, I don't think it was such a, um, a firm target as, as you're suggesting. I've just been flicking through it. I may be missing it because I'm sitting here. I can't see anything in the OIP which says, I know it was part of the commentary that the department did not launch was it would do that. It, it may have said, I may be just missing it, but uh, I think that you know, there's a, a difficulty in measuring the individual children, whereas we can count how many we paid maintenance to, and we can count how, many, how much we paid to them. We don't know um, what the other income into that household was. We'd have to do it on the distribution uh, of the households uh, in the country and, and distribution of the, of, the, um, of the caseload of the CSA against that. So I think it was a, you know, an imputed figure rather than an actual target that we could measure the number of cases against. 
Well, I know it wasn't, thanks. Sorry, I don't okay, think it well, was. Well, you say no, it was. You don't sound particularly convincing. But I mean, I, yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know where you want me to go, Mr. Mulholland. We've, we've said that we can't measure the number of children that, that were lifted out of poverty for the reasons it says in the note that, that you know, the relative level has moved since that goal was set, and we can't count. We don't count the household income of the receiving child. So if your point is that it was a target which couldn't be measured against from the beginning, then I'd accept that. Uh, I think it was said that this is a benefit, given the distribution of the case load at the time we did it, putting income into a you 40% know, increase in collections into that distribution, you would expect that sort of change. But uh, I think but, that's all I can say. But, but I, mean, I mean, with respect, it, you clearly said the plan, the operation improvement plan, was to lift 40,000 children out of poverty by March 2009. Well, not, not just in general, not as part of it. And, and you're sitting here and saying, well, yeah, we, we, we think this has happened, but we can't prove it, and this is why we can't prove it, and we could never prove it. I mean, that, it's absurd. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Well, I'm sure it's yeah. just saying it's just... Try and clarify something here. Are, are you saying that... The, the operational plan was set, and that was your responsibility, that somebody else in the DBB Empire assessed that delivery of the plan would get 40,000 children out of poverty. Yes. Is, it, is that your answer? Right. Sorry. So, so who was that then? So who I, 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 I couldn't remember names from four years ago, but I don't think it particularly is a helpful thing to do. Well, I think it would be a very helpful thing to do. I have to uh, disagree with that. I mean, I, mean th I think this is rather embarrassing. And, I, and I, what I would say to you, we're clearly not going to get to the bottom of this today. Can I ask you to go away and write to the committee um, and explain this? Because clearly it appears to us that there was a target with a definite date, March 2019. If, if you didn't set it, we need to know who did. And if you're saying it was achieved, please tell us, please prove it to us. That would be excellent. That's what we want to hear. Well, um, I'm, I'm, and, 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 and if you can't, then I want to know why that target was set in, in the first place, by, by whom? And I think that's an entirely reasonable thing to try to get through this, this confusion. I think what Stephen's tried to explain, though, it was not a target of the, uh, in, as, as, uh, as such, it was an imputed figure. And if in, indeed those who were creating the policy were saying that if the, if the targets set within the LIP are reached, then the expectation would be that 40,000 children would be lifted out of po poverty. Um, we can certainly go, go back and find out who made that assumption and on what basis. Uh, but I, I don't think it's right to say that, uh, um, that it is disproved, therefore. No, but we certainly like, I mean, as I say, the important thing is, has that happened or not? And that does need to be proved. You know, no, no one can set targets, you know, and, and let's face it, we're all very well aware, and this committee is particularly aware of the child poverty targets that are not going to be met for next year, and uh, we'll, we'll obviously find that out at some stage. You know, if people are setting targets of policy, then it's for those of us who scrutinise policy makers to find out if those and, and targets course, are, are being set. And, of course, you would need to include in that the, uh, the, uh, uh, the effect of the benefit disregard, because that of itself, I think, um, people are now able to keep uh, 20 pounds of that uh, benefit, and that has clearly made a significant difference to huge numbers of vulnerable people. An extra 20 pounds a week, if you're very poor, uh, makes a significant difference to, to the money that you have to spend on your children. And that uh, disregard, of course, will be a total disregard uh, from early next year. So um, I think the movement in the correct direction can be emphasised. The imputed figure of 40,000 40, uh, that came out of the policy, as, as I think Stephen has said, um, is set against uh, the delivery of the OIP, and indeed, um, not only was the OIP delivered, uh, but it was uh, uh, indeed um, the results were better than had been anticipated. So I don't, I don't feel any doubt that we would uh, um, be able to meet the claims. But I, as you say, we can certainly go back and have a look and see how those, uh, how that target. Um, as, as you describe it, though I don't think we would accept it as a target, but how that uh, imputed figure, shall we say, uh, actually came about and how one might actually uh, begin to look at what kind of measures around the numbers of children might actually be uh, drafted. That, that, that figure with a deadline of, of March 2009, which is, I think is the point, I don't see how that therefore isn't... A well, it's target. actually August 2010. Sorry, apologies. It, it did, my flicking through was too quick. The line says around 40,000 children lifted out of poverty by August 2010. Um, but it, 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 so it was mentioned in the, in the words in the Operation Improvement Plan. The targets that we were set for the Operation Improvement Plan are those that the NAO set out in the appendix to its memorandum, and this wasn't one of the targets for the OIP. So I stand by what I said, that it's impossible 
to count the actual number of children for the reason that we don't count the income into the recipient household, uh, but we can certainly come back to what the base of the 40,000 was. And, and, and if you, you, know, you say that you can't say, but we still need to know uh, as far as you possibly can say if that's happened. I mean, that, that is the point. I mean, that's the whole point of, of assessing this. And we may I mean, need I mean, to talk to somebody else to get that information, if, but it, if we just, between I'm, you. Just to follow up, Janet, you mentioned, mentioned the 100,000 uh, figure of, of children being lifted out of poverty from, from future reforms. So on the basis of the conversation we've just had, you know, will you be able to measure that figure? I will have to go back and look, as you have asked us to do, as to how, what measures were uh, thought about when the first, when the first figure was actually um, uh, uh, drafted. The numbers of families... Um, that will be affected by the, uh, the benefit disregard, of course we can, we will be able to count, and that of course I think is one of the most significant differences um, that we, we argued for through, through the legislation that has not come into being yet. The, the 20 pounds disregard is, is now in place and making a difference to very many. Um, we can find out how many families, and of course we can also find out how many families uh, will be affected by the, the total disregard. Yeah. And, and you mentioned the total disregard, which is you know, clearly hugely important and something the committee uh, you know, ha has, has raised positively in the past. Um, what impact do you expect that to have on the total numbers um, of maintenance paid by non-resident parents when, when that comes in? Could, could you estimate that? Um, I, I couldn't. I don't think it, reflect it. It, it reflects the recipient rather than how much is paid. No, sorry, not how much. It's the, the total uh, numbers of people actually paying that it could be brought in. Would you be able to estimate that? I'm sorry, I don't think it changes that. It, the number of people who get it we could estimate. Mm. But, but you know, the, it, it's, it's a, a question where we route the money that's collected rather than how many people pay it. So if, yeah, we, we could estimate, I, I couldn't give you another time ever. We could estimate that. I mean, that'd be, again, if you could put that in note, that, yes, would, that, that would be useful for us. Thank you. Thank you. We think you got to nine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we do wish every success because you know this is too long a saga, and uh, we all want the same objective. And uh, we thank you for being here today. And we know what you said. Thank you.